Yep. All right. Where did you put it? Uh, right at the beginning. Okay. Um, any other changes? I'll take a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 COVID. Yeah, hi. Um, so I don't have COVID, but I don't want to wear a mask tonight and try to talk. It's, it's hard to hear. Maybe it's hard to hear me now. Um, we have uh, three positive cases of COVID in our recreation program. I spent a good part of the day today with uh, Nick, and I don't think he has COVID, but in case there's a possibility that he might, here I am in here, and I'll, I'll attend the meeting from here tonight, just not to uh, be near any of you. Um, we have, as I said, we have three positive cases. Um, one was uh, tested positive, I think, Friday last week, did not attend camp. Uh, and then two more over the weekend. As far as I know, none of the positive cases have attended camp. But um, we have reached out to the Department of Health, uh, explained the situation to them as to what's going on. Uh, we have camp in three different locations, uh, the Scout Hall, the Wesley Methodist Church, and St. Leo's Hall. All of the cases that we have had a positive test for are uh, located at St. Leo's. The health department has asked us to not have camp at the St. Leo's venue tomorrow. So if your children go to uh, camp, uh, the rec program at, at the rec building near the pool or at Wesley Methodist Church, they can still go. Uh, we're hoping that the suspension is one day for St. Leo's. The health department wants to do a little bit of research and some additional contact tracing evidently. So there will be no program tomorrow at St. Leo's. Um, children uh, who have siblings that are at the other locations potentially, those siblings should be kept home as well tomorrow, if at all possible. We didn't learn this from the health department until after five o'clock tonight. So it's a little bit challenging to get the word out. Uh, Nick is working as we speak, trying to get information out to the, uh, to the folks, especially those who attend the day camp at, um, at St. Leo's. Um, this I think should be stated is out of that abundance of caution, the health department does not think that this is a widespread outbreak, but uh, just to be, uh, to be safe, they've asked us to do this. Uh, I've talked with Nick, we've already, as of the information we had last week, uh, campers were told all staff members are wearing masks now. And uh, the participants were told that masks are um, optional. I would like the select board for, for the rest of this week anyway, to make the masks mandatory when the children are inside. Um, it's not something that the uh, health department is mandating, but um, you know the kids wore masks at school. Uh, and I think that it might not be a bad idea to do that. So that's my request of you. Um, staff is wearing masks in the, in the buildings. Uh, when they're outside at the pool scattered out around, there's much more opportunity for um, social distancing. Most of the time, the kids are outside. Uh, they might eat lunch and while they're eating, they obviously can't wear masks. So. This is a very narrow window that we would be asking masks to be worn, but I think it makes sense in all the locations 
uh, for the rest of this week, and then we can reassess from there. So I'll stop with that, see if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Bill. Um, questions? Just a quick question, Bill. Are any of the three cases, or all three, are they the Delta variant? I don't know, man. Okay. As far as I've heard, most positive cases have been. Positive. Yeah, that's what I'm. You know, that's what we're hearing. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments on what Bill's requesting? No, just curious um, if you're expecting or prepared to handle. Or I assume Nick would be <clears throat> any pushback or. Um, yeah, any pushback from families who don't want to have their kids, students wear masks indoors and whatever that might come back on you and Nick. Well, to me, pushback is if you don't want your kids to wear a mask, take them home. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't, uh, I think that, that we're asking to do something that's reasonable given the circumstances. We're not asking them to wear the mask all day long. Um, I think that they they should they should do it. Like, they're the boys, so. Bill, yep. Lisa, Lisa has asked if the cases are campers or staff. Only campers right now. Nobody on staff has tested. Nobody on staff has uh, has got COVID, so it's three campers. Um, I'm, t I'm totally fine with that. I think it's reasonable. And I know that kids, at least under a certain age, can't get vaccinated. So I think to try to limit spread, I think it's a reasonable request. So I'm in support and we'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Can you I, define the, just this week or for the remainder of camp? So you were asking for, at least for now, just the remainder of this week? Yeah, what I would ask you to do is do it for the rest of this week um, or until we hear that it's not uh, you know, necessary. And then I would ask that you, since you're not gonna meet again until um, uh, you know, two weeks from now, uh, that if there's a need that you'll authorize me to make that decision going forward if we have to. I'll, I'll amend my motion to make it for this week and subject to extension by a, by approval by the town manager. Okay. Second. Second. All right, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, any other conversations about COVID in terms of town <laughs> office, any changes? No, nope. I mean, obviously we're still doing no, these meetings. Uh, we're open, um, and uh, you know we will obviously. Uh, most of the rec staff don't come into this building. Nick is generally the only one. Uh, he can make himself scarce and work other places most of the time. He does anyway. Uh, I think we will certainly take whatever precautions we feel is necessary. I don't want to be alarmist about this, but. You know, the health department did suggest that we close down that one venue for tomorrow. And, and I think that in the masks for now is uh, is all we have to do. And we'll just keep people, uh, you know, an eye out. And if if this becomes a wider spread outbreak, then obviously we'll have to consider doing doing more. But I'm hopeful that this will be it and we'll return to normal pretty quick. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, we will move on then to consent agenda items. Minutes from July 19th meeting, outside consumption permit for cold hollow cider. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, public. Uh, is there anyone here for the public? This is an opportunity to speak to anything that's not on the agenda. Um, 
you're more than welcome to be called upon for items in the agenda. But um, anyone here tonight wish to speak on anything that's currently not on here? Can I get a couple of names back there? There's Mike and John Griffin. John Griffin. I'm John Ritter. John Ritter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we are past 708, so I guess if there's no one from the public which to speak, we'll move on to the introduction of new library director, Christine Wolf. I have a question here. Um, if you wouldn't mind coming up, just because there's microphones and this has okay. to pick you up for anyone who is on Zoom. Um, I'm Christine Wolf, currently the chair of the library commission, not the new library director. I'm just here this evening to let you all know that we did hire a new library director, Rachel News. She's here tonight. Thank you for staying late. Um, and I also wanted to use this opportunity um, to publicly thank the library, public library staff, uh, especially Michelle Willie. Um, we had about two months of an interim in between directors, and um, they all stepped up and went above and beyond um, in order to keep patient services running without interruption and then reopen the library. Um, for in-person services, and it's um, very, um, been incredibly smoothly because of their hard work. And Rachel started last Tuesday, and um, she's here if anyone has any questions for her. Great. We stole her from Fletcher. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to come up and say any words or anything? Um, well, I just, I just, I just wanted to say uh, that I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I've always really loved Waterbury, and I think this is just an amazing library. Uh, and uh, it is a very interesting time <laughs> to be stepping into the role of library director, but uh, I'm so lucky to have the staff in place who seem to be uh, on top of things. So uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts or suggestions, stop by the library anytime and chat with me, and we'll talk about what you want to see from your library. Do you have a general vision for the future of the library? Well, my general vision for the library is to, to do all that we can to be a resource for the community, especially uh, the people who, who most need it. Um, but right now at this time, my uh, my goal is to get that library back up and running and back to pre-COVID, um, you know, standards. Although also well, continuing to remain cautious and thoughtful as we, we continue to navigate the pandemic. So that's very much on the top of my mind. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, with that, we'll move to the Stowe Street Bridge project presentation. And do we want to move off the table, or I don't know how this is set up for tonight? I think it's okay if you stay where you are. Okay. So we're going to have a presentation up on the screen here so everybody that's joined via Zoom should be able to see this as well. I'll speak somewhat loudly so everybody behind me can hear. Um, so welcome. This is the alternatives presentation meeting for Bridge 36 over Thatcher Brook, known as the Stowe Street Bridge. Um, I'm Laura Stone. I'm the VTRAN scoping engineer. Um, at the end of the scoping process, this project is going to be handed off to a design project manager, and that's uh, Jonathan Griffin sitting in the back of the chair. And um, we also have Tom Knight here today. He's the Stantec uh, project manager. So this is going to be designed by, um, by a consultant, Stantec. We brought him on board for the design of the bridge. So the purpose of tonight's meeting, we really want to provide an understanding of VTrans's approach to the project, uh, provide an overview of the project constraints, talk about the resources around the bridge. We're going to give you some uh, of the existing conditions of the existing bridge and um, ultimately talk about the alternatives that we considered and the recommended alternative. Um, at the bottom there, it says provide um, opportunity to ask questions, voice concerns. Um, I'm happy to take questions as they come up. It doesn't need to be at the end of the presentation. This could be um, a little bit more of a collaborative presentation. So there's a location map. Um, I think everybody's pretty well aware of where it is. It's just east of um, the I-89 interchange at the, at the intersection of um, Route 100, uh, Flush, Flush Hill and Stowe Street. 
Um, so first I'm going to talk about the VTrans project development process, just to give you an idea where we are in the project development process. Then again, we're going to go over project overview, talk about the existing conditions of the bridge, the alternatives that we considered in the scoping report, and the recommended alternative. Ultimately, we really want to build consensus towards that recommended alternative. We're going to talk about maintenance of traffic, uh, the schedule, so when you can expect to see this project in construction, a summary, and again, questions are at the bottom there, but we can really take questions at any time in this presentation. This slide is really just to show that we're at this really, really early stage of project development called project definition. Project's been funded. Um, this is where we're identifying the resources, so the environmental resources, the cultural resources, identifying the constraints around the bridge so we can take them into consideration while we're evaluating alternatives. Um, Public participation, that's where we are right now. And ultimately, we really want to build consensus towards, towards a recommended project. At the end of this presentation, we'll be looking at the to the town to make a decision on how they want to proceed. That's when it's that's when we consider it project defined. That's when we're going to move into the design of the bridge, quantifying the areas of impact. That's where we're going to do environmental permitting, the uh, right-of-way process if needed. At the end of that contract will be awarded and the project will go to construction. So Act, one, uh, Act 153 of the 2012 legislative session, per Act 153, the local share is reduced by 50% for rehabilitating versus replacing a bridge. Again, it's reduced an additional 50% for closing the road to traffic during construction and that is vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic. So in the past, all projects were 80% federally funded, 10% state funded, and 10% town funded for the Town Highway Bridge Program. So this could potentially drop the town's funding share from 10% to 5% or 2.5%, depending on, you can see in the, the chart there, the different options. Okay. So, Hi, I'm Tom. I'm going to jump in here and um, just give a little overview of the existing conditions uh, of the current bridge, talk a little bit about some of the alternatives that, that we looked at um, from an engineering standpoint, and then I'll go over um, an evaluation matrix that helps kind of define how the different choices stack up against one another. Um, so just the picture up here is really to define the, uh, the pieces, pieces and parts of the bridge that we're going to talk about. Um, starting from the top there, you've got the, the bridge deck and the bridge railing. Um, underneath the bridge deck are the bridge beams, sometimes referred to as stringers. Um, this particular bridge we're talking about, the existing one out there, those, those stringers are concrete and they're actually, um, they're actually integral with the, the bridge deck, like poured all together as one, one piece. You'll see that in some of the um, inspection photos later. But just so when we're naming pieces, um, you know what we're talking about. Then the the concrete that supports the bridge on either end we refer to as the uh, the bridge substructure. Um, those are bridge abutments and wing walls, and when, and the the really bottom pieces of, of concrete out there where where everything meets the ground that we refer to as the footing. So. All right. As far as the existing conditions go. Um, we actually had the opportunity to, to look at a lot of these existing conditions and constraints on the project site um, in a study we did for the, um, the Regional Planning Commission um, back in 2018. And I actually presented on that back, back then. So a lot of these slides are, are rehashing that information. Um, we, we, when we wrote that existing conditions report, we were, we were really um, aiming towards turning into eventually the scoping report that we presented to the town recently. So um, the, the road classification for this Stowe Street Bridge is considered a local um, class two road. Um, it's, it's only a 44 foot span, which is kind of small. The existing bridge is concrete teething construction um, from 1928 and owned by the town of the Waterbury Village. Um, so, there is currently a five foot sidewalk and it's on the downstream side of the bridge. 
Um, we recognize this is a residential area. There's a ski on the bridge. There, there's a sewer line that parallels the bridge and is supported on a separate structure that's in relatively good condition right now. Um, to, to break it down here, to talk about some of the issues with the current bridge, um, a lot of them are geometric. Um, it, there are some structural issues, but nothing urgent from a structural standpoint. Um, really, functionally, the bridge is built like a typical 1928 bridge. It's, it's narrow, you know, ten foot, two 10 foot wide lanes. Um, unfortunately, you do have that, that sidewalk on it. And a, lot of, a lot of those bridges were built without a sidewalk. Um, one of the things we identified in the 2018 study was that the, the current sidewalk is really on the wrong side of the bridge for the way pedestrian traffic moves out there now and for the, for the town's plan, the pedestrian traffic. <laughs> Um, the town would prefer that to be on the upstream side of the bridge. Um, as far as the structural condition goes, um, right now the, the bridge is on a I believe it's an annual inspection cycle. Um, no, the, the normal inspection cycle for VTrans would be to inspect bridges every two years. And the, it's gotten to the point now where um, the deterioration is accelerating a little bit, so VTrans is watch, actually watching it on an annual basis. Um, and it's it's pretty, it's almost a regular annual event that Alec will call us up and ask us to go look at a chunk of concrete that has fallen off there or something. So it's, it's in poor structural con condition right now. It's on its way out. It's, it's served its useful life. Um, an another issue with the, with the structure is the, um, it services the park and ride and there are transit buses that come in and out of there. So the turning geometry with those narrow lanes is, is kind of difficult. Um, the intersection alignment is a, is a challenge. And we heard that the traffic um, queuing to get onto Vermont 100 is also kind of an issue. Um, so we also see some opportunities here. Um, you know, back in 2017, broad reach planning looked at um, ways to improve the pedestrian mobility in the region. And you know, one, one of the things that was looked at here was moving that sidewalk over, um, possibly providing um, improved wider shoulders for, for cyclists. Um, I think there's been a, a VTrans pedestrian improvement pro project or sidewalk improvement project that, that's been brought into design and then it was paused because it was decided we really need to figure out the bridge part of things here first, but um, that, that pedestrian <clears throat> sidewalk improvement project identified, you know, a little section of sidewalk up on Vermont 100 that the town would like to build, um, a, a crosswalk across Vermont 100, section of sidewalk on what I'm going to call the north side of Vermont 100, um, and some improvements down here at the Lincoln Street intersection. So again, this project was tabled because it was decided that the, the bridge project really needed to go first to make the most efficient use of this improve, these improvements. Okay, so back to existing conditions of the, of the bridge itself. Um, you know, it's, it's falling concrete. That's when the exterior portion of the concrete pops off due to the corrosion of the rebar. Um, that's happening on the stringers and in various locations on the abutments. It's very typical for bridges this age, um, cracking. Just, um, you're seeing all the signs of this thing being 100 years old. So this, this picture is a little less flattering. Um, this is a 2018 photo. And actually, the, the town did a nice job. Um, they actually repaired a lot of the the issues with this abutment and we at the time we advised them that it wasn't worth it to, to fix these spalling areas on the beams because those are that, that reinforcement is going to be really difficult to um, to patch over it's just going to continue to spall off concrete so all right so looking at the bridge from the upstream side um, that it it partially includes the waterway right now um, Ideally, 
bigger, you would have a, uh, a 45 foot. Um, you have a 45 foot stream. You'd like to you'd like to have about a 50 foot, 50 to 55 foot opening there. So when the water comes up high, it has plenty of room to get through there and not and for debris not to get hung up on the abutments. All right. So here's an existing conditions layout and. The reason I'm using this rather than the, the, the Google map image is we're going to overlay a bunch of pictures of, of bridge and intersection options on top of here. So I just want to get everyone familiar and oriented. That kind of flips the view on you here. Um, so north is to the right in this picture. So this is the Blush Hill intersection. If you can see my cursor on the far right side, um, the river's flowing from the bottom of the page up the page in that plain view picture. Um, the, the Lincoln Street intersection is over here, and here we have North Street and the lower portion of Stowe Street. Um, included here, we also have a, um, a existing bridge typical section that basically just shows what we saw from those easy pictures. Tom, yes. Uh, Bill's asked that you look at your computer rather than the big screen, because the owl will pick you up better. I'll do my best for that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> is it just the, the way my voice is projecting? Is that what's... I think so. Yeah. Okay. You have to talk into the owl. Uh, thank you. Uh, you need that. Technology. Yeah. Okay. So looking looking at my computer now, um, the existing layout, and we'll also present a series of these um, typical sections to show what with the roadway we're proposing and with the sidewalk we're proposing on the road and on the bridge. Um, a lot of these are very similar, except the graphics of the, the type of bridge we're showing will vary. Um, but here, here we're showing that the existing travelways are roughly 20 feet. Um, and the sidewalk is also five feet wide. Okay. So one of the things we did back in 2018 um, was try and establish the design criteria for this structure. Um, so when we got into the scoping process, we could kind of hit different ground on any you know what kind of alternatives we'd be looking at. Um, the average daily traffic over the bridge is 3,000 vehicles per, per day. Um, the design hourly volume across the bridge is 430 vehicles per hour. So that's like the the peak hour from a design standpoint that you, that you look at. Um, there's about 3% trucks, design speed is 25 miles per hour. I, I think I mentioned um, the, the sewer line is one of the utilities, but there's actually also a water line just upstream um, of, the, of the existing bridge. And there's an overhead guy wire. I'll flip back to the existing conditions so I can kind of highlight that from the cursor. So there's, there's an overhead utility line that runs just upstream of the bridge here. There actually aren't any utilities carried on that. It's just, it's a cable that connects poles that are on both sides of the stream. So um, it's one of their tricks for not putting extra anchors in the ground. And um, almost all of our construction options would impact that. So I'm taking it down a little bit. Okay, so now we'll talk about an outline of the alternatives we looked at. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, because I'm going to go through the individual pictures for these. Um, but, but basically, um, we do look at a no action alternative as part of our matrix. And all the alternatives we looked at, we, we made almost the same roadway geometry decisions. Um, we, we looked at putting a, a right, adding a right turn lane to the structure uh, and increasing the width of the lanes um, so that the typical section we're looking at with all these alternatives has a three foot shoulder three 12 foot lanes another three foot shoulder and then a five foot sidewalk um, and uh, that'll make more sense when i when i bring up some pictures there but any of those any of those alternatives we're going to show we're going to show it as three 12 12 12 3 5 configuration that could easily be substituted for Four foot shoulders, which give a little better, um, a little more room for cyclists, and and actually a little less room for cars, and that can slow traffic down a little bit. 
So, you, I'm sorry, while we're looking at that, can you tell, say, the current numbers as well? Sure. I know we have the 10, 10, 5, but I don't know what the shoulders look like. But right now, yeah, you don't have shoulders. Exactly. I mean, it's, the sidewalk is right. We, we might call it. We might call it one nine nine one. Right. The way it is right now, um, because usually a, a car, a motorist will shy away from a, a sidewalk curb or a bridge rail, even though there really isn't a painted shoulder out mm -hmm. there. But essentially, you have no shoulder out there right now. So we'd be improving that. In any case, improving it to a minimum of three feet and. And depends on the town's preference there to go to four foot shoulder. Is this affecting the sewer on that? Yeah, system? pretty much all, all yeah, almost all the alternatives will affect the mm -hmm. sewer. Um, we're, we're not trying to work around that mm -hmm. within these. Um, I think it's worth mentioning at this point that the sewer is a participating cost to the project. And so if I mean if the town has a five percent share for the project, they would only have to pay five percent of that relocation. So we did look at a, a superstructure rehabilitation, which is technically a feasible option. You know, you could repair what's out there, you could um, put it back in condition, but we don't we don't give that a lot of value. It's really a short-term fix, and and we assign it a 15-year design line, um, and that that'll kind of show up in the cost per year analysis that we look at. Um, so then. Another another option is uh, superstructure replacement and widening of the existing abutments, which is also feasible. Um, that that substructure that's out there, if you, if you repair it and we're, we're able to widen it, you can get a good 15 years out of that before you have to do more work on it. So if you feel like that's feasible, we'll, we'll show that in the mix of alternatives here. Um, and then we also looked at a full bridge replacement. Um, one of the with two options for the full bridge replacement. One of them was with a buried structure, which I'll describe a little bit more with the pictures. And the other one would be a full bridge replacement with a steel beam bridge. Um, so, so again, I, I mentioned that all of the roadway portions of the design kind of have the same features or similar features. Um, and when we looked at this back in 2018, the way we explained it is this really is more of like a roadway and intersection type of project and it just happens to have a bridge in the middle. Um, there are some issues with the turning geometry on Lincoln Street. There's, there's some queuing issues and really the need for a right-hand right, right -hand turn lane coming out to Vermont 100 in order to improve, improve traffic. And the bus turning geometry really dictates things here. So I'm gonna that slide here to show the bus turning movements. And these, these are the things that dictate here are buses turning onto Lincoln Street and buses turning off from Lincoln Street. But the, the one that's not shown here is, is there's another right hand turn lane from Vermont 100 onto, onto Stowe Street. That one's actually not that tricky for the bus to navigate and it doesn't dictate the geometry. These, these are the, the three, four critical turning movements that define everything. And you can see the, the shape of the intersections we've drawn here are, are just built to accommodate those turns. Um, so it's so we end up with this kind of sweeping corner down here where Lincoln Street meets Stowe Street and um, really realigning the, the end of Lincoln Street to make it team a little more of a 90 degrees instead of that sharp angle that it comes in at right now. So that, that's that's kind of the common features. Um, I mentioned the, the three lanes. So we, we have a straight and left turn lane um, coming off of Stowe Street, and then we also have a, a right hand turn lane coming off of Stowe Street. Can I ask a question? Yeah. On that right turn on Stowe Street on the Lincoln Street, is that gray area there to shorten the pedestrian crossing? Why? Why do you bring in that radius like that instead of allowing? Um, yeah, that actually has to do with the um, with the bus turning. Um, I meant over to the left. Oh, over there. Right there, yeah. Um, we're just yeah, we're just trying not to have too wide a pavement area there. Also, I, I think there, there's a there is a benefit from a shortening of the of the pedestrian phase 
different pedestrians to get across because that's a stop sign condition. So um, it's really it's really just we try not to have wide open pavement entrances because then cars tend to wander and do whatever they whatever they feel like. We like to give them a defined place to go. Um, some of the more dangerous, you know, you remember some of the more dangerous like plaza entrances are these big wide open things where cars can come in and out wherever they want. Um, so, so I think from a safety standpoint, it's better to just narrow that entrance. So to that point, Tom, um, that I'll call it a ball belt for lack of a better term. Um, how's that going to work when it comes to plowing during plowing season? Um, yes. So what we're proposing on this corner, and I think you'll see this is more common um, throughout the state now at intersections, is giving a a truck island type of curve there, similar to what you have down in the roundabout, where the, um, there'll be a curve there at the edge of pavement, but it, it'll be mountable by the, that bus, so the bus can go up on the concrete portion, but they won't be on the sidewalk. And I'm not, I'm not sure if that creates a, an incredible difficulty from a maintenance standpoint, but um, I, I would think that they would just be plowing the the paved portion and then using that as part of snow storage. Yeah, I was more interested in the, the left side where the sidewalk is. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure about the, the plow geometry, but I think I think a plow can still navigate that kind of corner. And it, it, I guess this would be considered storage. Yeah, I was going to say because typically on intersections like that, that's where you get a lot of buildup from the snow because you got you know, snow from two different roads coming into an intersection typically have uh, more snow deposits in those types of areas. My other question is, you can see on that drawing that the, the brook uh, bottlenecks there a little bit um, as part of this project proposal. Um, you, know, you talked about widening that mouth. Uh, between the two abutments, would it widen it enough to make it uh, similar to the the two wider parts of the brook above and below? It would. We're we're shooting for the for the natural channel with yeah. any of these options, um, and I, we haven't we haven't changed that graphically in any of these pictures because the the blue line just kind of followed the existing stream, but all the all the bridge replacement options we're looking at. Do you give a, a wider opening, a wider span line? How do you deal with kind of the? I feel like right now when you come up to that intersection, you're blind to the traffic coming up Stowe Street when you either want to take a left on a Stowe Street off Lincoln or even just the right. And just when you're coming off Lincoln, yeah, yeah, like wondering how you deal with you know if you stop right there, yep. How good of a visibility visibility do you have to the traffic coming from where that light blue bus is? This is something I don't have a graphic um, available for this, but it is in the in the scoping report that we looked at. We did look at sight lines, and one of the one of the things you allow the um, analysis to do is allow the allow the driver to cheat up even beyond the stop bar, and and even go on to the crosswalk. When they're when they're kind of creeping out to see that view, but I, I think as, as part of this project, um, that one of the things I didn't mention was the sidewalk limits. Is in order to tie in sidewalk, we'd be um, introducing a crosswalk here over near the top of North Street, and adding sidewalk on the um, I'll call it the upstream just to be consistent here. The, the upstream side, um, basically along here. On the, on the upper part of Stowe Street. That's going to improve sight lines by keeping the vegetation back a little bit and we'll be kind of pulling that bank back a little bit as, as part of the project. Because right now there's no sidewalk there, it's just on that. Correct. The, yeah. Let me flip back to the existing conditions. The, the sidewalk's not on the, um, yeah. Yeah, on the downstream side right now. So, so flipping that, that piece over. Um, so that, that's going to that's gonna help improve things a little bit. And then I, I think that this this geometry of essentially getting yourself 90 degrees to the roadway when you come in there is also going to help um, see what's going on in both directions. So we, we 
glaube, kommen und für die Uni dann sehr geil. Also, sei schön. Um, mention a little bit more about sidewalk connections here. Um, one of the things we discussed with VTrans when you're coming up with a recommended scope here was the limits of the sidewalk work and what's appropriate to do as part of this project and what would be appropriate for the town to take on in future endeavors. And one of the things we decided was it made sense to bring this project all the way up to that crosswalk area on Vermont 100. So basically, the, this new sidewalk portion here, we have all part of the recommended scope for the project. So, we, can I comment on this? Yes. Um, you know, when they were doing 100, that intersection came up a lot because a lot of, well, as I think many of us know, a lot of people do cross there when there's no crosswalk. And basically, as it was told to us, there wasn't a, a safe way to create a lane on either side of the road. So it wasn't part of that project. But then this project comes and now it's maybe limited where that project would have picked it up if this came first. It's like a little chicken egg. But to me, it seems like you trans should consider making sure that there's a safe crossing over 100 that could have been part of that other project and then, you know, whatever that landing zone is on the other side, I really do think that we, this, this intersection, I'm surprised people haven't gotten hit on this. I think it's crossed way more than um, it's realized. And I see it on a daily basis and I'm sure many of us do as well. And I really would hope that that would be considered as part of this because I think that is crucial. And it could have been involved in that other project if this bridge wasn't where it is. So it's, it's unfortunate to think that it would end there and not pick up what was missed on that other project. Mark, could I mention something on that? Sure. Um, Steve Watts, Beach is a uh, planning zone director. So we have an active um, bike and ped grant for um, this project that has been put on hold. So I think my understanding is once the bridge is reconstructed, then the um, that bike and ped grant project, which um, which was shown, Tom showed earlier, uh, this would be redesigned to put the sidewalk on the on the upstream side of the bridge, and then this project would actually be built, or the additional pieces would be built through the bicycle and ped pedestrian program. So I think the V Trans is committed to that crosswalk on Route 100. That's my understanding that that will be an add-on project. So it's part of this SDP EP17 Grant 11 um, project that, that is still funded. And, and how does it work for the cost in, in terms of signaling and everything that was the infrastructure put in place when 100 was redone for this, or is that all new? Uh, no, that that would have to follow. Um, this would be a separate project from the paving project. So no, none of this. Uh, was done perhaps with the exception of some of the signal improvements. Um, I think there may have been some, some accommodation there. I think there might be some conduit. Design there might be some conduit under the roadway. Yeah, there, which is which is one of the more costly pieces. Um, that, that's my recollection too, Tom. Yeah, that the conduit's there for the <clears throat> pedestrian signals. It'll be a dedicated crossing with the pedestrian. Uh, Walk sign and so on. Yeah, so they have, they have a place to string the wires under under the road yeah. there, but they don't have the pedestals on both sides there. Talking about how that was driven by the bus turning geometry and talking about sidewalk limits. Um, let me get into the alternatives and then. If you see anything out that catches your eye about current conditions, then I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so in the in the scoping report, we looked at alternatives, and one of them was a, a temporary pedestrian bridge to this moving traffic during construction. And just to just to give you an idea of a possible layout for that, um, this is this is one. Um, there are there are multiple places you could put this temporary pedestrian bridge. You could put it further upstream, and you could actually put it just downstream of the construction. 
Um, I think the end result here is that it's it's, a, it's about the same um, impact and has the same kind of influence on our decision making. So this is just really a placeholder that's shown here. Um, location. So the other thing we will talk about is the potential for a temporary bridge. Um, I've also shown that, and really you could put that in other places also. But um, the idea the idea is it would be tough pretty close to the existing construction or to the existing bridge and it'd be real near the construction zone, which is ideal. And this would be for cars. This would be for cars. The, the purple one you're showing is for cars, but the yellow one showing is for if we were just for the temporary pedestrian bridge. Would the um, vehicle bridge also accommodate the buses? Or would it be too limiting? It, it, it could still accommodate buses. I think the turning geometry would be mm -hmm. tricky with that. And in general, I don't mean to steal the thunder of the, the alternative discussions here, but in, but in general, the um, any temporary bridge alternative is really tricky tricky to get to work from a traffic standpoint. So see how that this end of the temporary bridge um, as close to the existing intersection as possible. That's necessary, or you create an offset intersection condition. Which gets really tricky from, from one traffic light trying to serve essentially two staggered intersections. And that does weird things with the way that traffic queues up to make turns. Um, and when when you're coming off one leg of the intersection, it can it can kind of cause other other intersections that could currently go simultaneously if they leave. The, this traffic signal here is already at capacity. And in introducing a temporary bridge here in any kind of offset intersection makes it really, really tricky. So that's actually something we're not recommending. Um, but I just want to show the picture and so we can talk about the recommendations a little later. All right. So then th this is just looking at um, different bridge alternatives. So the, the way the alternatives report was set up. You could kind of mix mix and match any bridge alternative with any traffic control alternative. And so you could you could have the superstructure replacement option and you could throw a temporary bridge on there. Um, you know, and the way we compiled compile them was, you know, it was option two, and then two A was with the with the temporary pedestrian bridge, and two B was with the temporary traffic bridge, or you know, some 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 variation of that kind of numbering and organization system. But so basically, we look at these kind of independently. The idea would be to just choose a bridge you want to pick here. Um, and this is this is to just depict the superstructure replacement option with the widened substructure. Um, and that's kind of depicted down here by the um, light gray being the existing portions of the existing abutments are remaining, and then we would build on both sides to widen it out. And then Obviously, why the, the new superstructure on top of that? We, we show this profile picture. So, what this is to show the slope of the roadway um, in the final condition. And I think the big takeaway with all of our profiles here is that we're going to keep it more or less the same as it is out there right now. We're not trying to wave the gray or lower the gray or anything. It's, it's kind of challenging enough with the hill as it is right now. And we have, we have plenty of clearance over the over the street, even when the water comes up high there, um, you can still kind of fit the water under the bridge. So really not going to mess with the profile. You'll see kind of the same thing with different graphics in here and the left behind. Okay, so alternative three, the um, bridge replacement with buried structure. Um, so this one's a little bit harder to, to describe with words, but it, basically, we're putting in like an arch type structure underneath the roadway. And that, the picture down below here is matching up really. Is that better? Okay. Um, so basically, you would, you would put the arch type structure underneath, and then you would have a layer of roadway structure. Um, and, and it would essentially for the town, it would behave a lot like a regular. Um, piece of road, they'd be able to maintain the pavement and everything, um, just like they treat a regular road. 
So in profile view, that, that shows you what's going on there. It's this arch um, slightly wider than existing. And we actually get a three-dimensional three graphic to give people an idea of what that looks like. Okay. That's a that's a cutaway to, to show you the arch and the from the roadway. All right, and then we have a, um, a full bridge replacement. This would be new bridge abutments set back from where the existing are and steel beams. Um, one of the tricky things about this design is we do have this little corner of bridge here that needs a um, what we call splitting beam underneath it. So you would need a, a beam that frames out that little triangle, which is just like it's a good little complication for us. Um, but we've done it before. Um, again, profile doesn't show much, and there really isn't much more to graph to show um, alternatives. If you have any questions or want to back up on those, I can do that. Can I just can I just add that with the buried structure option, um, one of the benefits of that option is that the sewer line can be in place if you go back. Oh yeah, that's good. That's the plan. Slides. Yeah, right it there. can be placed right in the fill above the culvert. Yeah. So if you ever need to, to change out anything with the sewer, um, basically basically it's treated like any other piece of sewer in the roadway. It's, it's a little more accessible by the time through and with it. If it comes under the bridge, that can be an issue as well. Okay. Um, I, I should note that these, these bridge barriers, too, um, what, I'm, what I'm showing there is a concrete barrier because we're assuming that the self preservation folks would like to replicate some of the, the features that are out there right now. So all these pictures show a little concrete. All right. Um, we did kind of gloss over the maintenance graphic option. Uh, let me go over that a little bit more here. Um, so, what we did look at for options were an offsite detour, um, which which means you put up detour signs, close the bridge area during construction, and then traffic finds its way around through another another route. Um, the, this ends up being the responsibility of the town to to choose and sign. That, that detour location, but we, we looked at some options that were mentioned during the um, previous existing condition study and gave a little bit of analysis of those. Should it be considered that we just relocate the parking ride for a period of time so we pick another parking area? And Absolutely. We, we, that is that is included, some discussion of that is included in, in, in the scoping report, but I, I think that's, that's key. And that actually fits in a little bit with the um, temporary pedestrian discussion too. Um, so again, off offsite detour option, temporary bridge option, temporary pedestrian bridge option. There's also a phased construction option that we usually look at, and that would be like cut the bridge in half, keep traffic on the half that you're keeping, while you rip away the other half and build new on that side. And that just doesn't really fit well with this narrow bridge and this old bridge. So we, so we did not look at that option for, for this study. Uh, or we looked at it, but this just didn't fit really quickly. All right. So, so to talk about um, offsite detour options, there's there's a really obvious detour is to send people down to Mount 100, back on Main Street, and then you know, back up back up Stowe Street. And that will take care of all the, the vehicular traffic options and um jonathan is going to be the project manager on that he, um, what, 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 what do you find that you were at oh i drive it every day it's just like i just, i bring my kids to the hundred mile and i go to both ways so my friends can eat the distance so so depending on which way the traffic depending on the light yeah, you can look over here so it's, it's quick quick and easy from um from a car standpoint and it is going to, but it is going to send a little bit more traffic down the Union Street. So um, we did some analysis on, on you know, the Union Street intersection and the Stowe Street intersection, and you might want to adjust the traffic timing um, on the Union Street and Stowe Street intersection during construction a little bit, just to um, get a, get a few more of those cars through each time. Um, there's a, there's a traffic movement, but it is this is very feasible, and I think you can from a, a vehicular standpoint. 
from, from a pedestrian standpoint, this would be the, the shortest pedestrian route to send people around to, but, it, but it's not safe to send people across that. It's limited access. It, yeah, it's currently limited access in interchange. And while we could, could make some modifications to it to, to make it more safe for pedestrians in the short term, we don't like that at all. Um, I think that would just create bad habits. You have, to, you have people still going through there after the construction projects are done. Um, that's, that's really dangerous. So we're not recommending sending pedestrians here at all. So then where do you send the pedestrians? And what we're showing here, we, we recognize it's not realistic. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's your shortest other, other route. Um, there is, there's actually is a, a Waterbury Trail route that was mentioned also that, that could cut off a little bit of this ridiculous detour we want. And we, we looked at that, we also think that that one's very feasible. Um, so if you, if you read into the scope of the report, what we're recommending here is to consider some travel options. Um, in reality, the there isn't a lot of pedestrian destination out there right now. So they're, they're, we feel like not providing any um, connection for pedestrians isn't horrible as long as we can make it better it, with, with the final condition. That we're Bill's asking um, what length of closure is construction to the construction be Right. Okay. So we impact school traffic. Yeah, when we started out here, um, we were looking at 90 days, and you know, I, I think we were confident we can drill that down to a 60 day closure. Yeah, it's pretty comfortable presenting these options. I know there's Shaw's employees that walk up Stowe Street almost every day mm -hmm. to get to work. Just hang a rope there on the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it definitely is tricky for someone that doesn't have access. A vehicle. I mean, it, it really is a long ways around. And what, so during the discussion of relocating the parking ride, um, there, there might be some options for like getting a shuttle bus to that Shaw's location and making a connection from the Shaw's location down to the um, state office complex. You know, some, some kind of shuttle connection like that, or even using one of the one of the buses that already do that route from the parking lot to the state office complex, um, using them as kind of another means to get around. I don't know that would be like limited time for the day. Um, the, the other option is you know to hire to hire a shuttle for that 60 days and have, have them on a regular schedule or on an on-call basis. What's the uh, typical expense added to the cost of the temporary pedestrian service? Um, I'll get into that here, but, but I, I think the the rough number there is for the for the construction cost it would probably add about two hundred thousand, but for the town share, um, it it'll put you in that category where you're not only paying five percent, you're going to pay ten percent. So it really impacts the town <coughs> a lot to do that. Is that, is that fair? That, yeah, okay. that's. For the 10 week literary closure, we have to be a show every day, and that would be about $90,000 for 10 weeks. Okay, our pedestrian show. So that would be a shorter duration, but it's more than 90 cost. But that would be a 10%. That's fully found. No, that's a, that would be paid a whole. That would depend on the owner of the selected, but if you close the bill with a 5% share, you have to pay for the So if you're still getting the five percent share, then it would be on the ten percent option, and I think finding is efficient depending on what you need. All right. So now we get to the recommended alternative. I don't know if you can tell, by the way, I'm stopping that. Um, we we are recommending the full bridge replacement, and we like the bare structure option. Um, multi plate. You're talking about. I'm sorry. Multi plate. Um, it's not multi play, it's probably precast concrete, but um, it'll, there's a couple options for how we build that structure, but um, it'd be out of concrete. Um, and then 
So we also are recommending traffic maintain and last site detour. Um, and the reasoning there is not only the town's share, reducing the town's share with that pedestrian bridge and all the traffic complications and all that. Um, it's also a safety issue to, to be having those pedestrians walk through the construction zone. So I'm gonna sorry to keep it here, but I'm gonna flip back and show the pictures. You know, any any connection we make that ties into Lincoln Street, even if it's further away from the construction of this, if you're if you're put further upstream, you're still gonna be routing pedestrians through a, a pretty active, busy work site where we're trying to get your bridge built in 60 days. So we don't we don't like that option. Um, the the, the, the um, vehicular traffic option is similar to that. It really complicates things. In fact, you introduce the vehicular traffic option and, and the the short duration construction goes up a little bit here. Like we we have to to build a bunch of time in the project to install the pedestrian or the temporary bridge, um, get it up and running, and then do our construction and take it off down right there. So it, it kind of maintains the time it takes to get everything done. So so for both safety reasons and um, I think cost reasons, we're not recommending a further use in that area. Would I assume that if we would do some sort of a temporary bridge, you probably in that whole area need um like sheriff's department, you know helping guide traffic along. Boy, we, we, were, we were trying to find it so that if we were doing something like that, so that we could spell out the route to the pedestrian. So we try and do it with just detour signing and corralling. Um, it, it, it is possible to kind of okay. take them through there, but it, it, what really what happens is the pedestrians end up gawking the construction. We just, they're, yeah. they're there and it's easy. Um, any danger of him, so and and pedestrians will be so then they'll climb all the barriers that through here. Take pictures. Yeah. Um, all right. So so um I, I mentioned the 60 day closure duration. That's one of the things we like about this option. Um again, the, the whole 12 foot lane and three foot shoulder thing is completely up to the town if they prefer. The slightly narrower traffic lanes and wider shoulders. Um, we're, we're open to that. In fact, I think most most people are in favor of that one. Um, so, a span length of approximately 50 feet. That's that meets all the hydraulic recommendations and ANR stream um, stream opening recommendations. So this this is just a note more from an engineering standpoint. But the substructure is going to be counted on ledge out there. So um, it, it wouldn't be pile supported. It would be, we, we probe everything out there and find where the bedrock is and we dig down and build it on the bedrock, um, which is nice and it's just down and just it's great. Um, historic railing, um, that's that's part of the recommendation um, to be get rid of the concerns with the historic character of the existing bridge. And there, there likely will be right way needed for this, but then the structure is getting wider than it is right now. Um, there is some aerial utility relocation required, and then there's relocation of that sewer line, which is the municipal line. Sewer line is part of the project. Yeah, um, just speak up and more clearly. There's a comment. Yeah. Just speak. Oh, do I need to speak up more clearly? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Okay, and we'll have to figure because uh, our we don't have a village anymore. I'm, I'm sure you might be aware, I and mean, we have something called D five, which is our utility district. So we'll have to just figure out between the town and D five who. But I like it. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Yeah. I can. Okay, so here are the the numbers. Um. I think of most importance is the this is total construction costs that we're looking at on the, the top one there. The total product costs. Okay. So the replacement alternatives are in, in the same ballpark as far as the construction costs. Um, you know, when you add in a temporary bridge, 
we're adding about five hundred thousand dollars, but it has other drawbacks um, associated with it. Not only that, but the town share of these as well. All, all this, all these numbers and more are included in the scoping report. Um, I tried to boil this down and make it somewhat readable here, so I'm not including all the individual items for the highway costs and existing structure removal and all those other things. But there's more detail in the scoping report if you want to dig into the numbers. What we try to capture here is total project costs, um, the the town's share, and then we also include a number here for annualized construction costs. So this is not an incredibly complicated economic formula that makes interest rates and the time value of money or anything like that. It's it's simply taking what we think the total project cost is going to be and dividing it by the number of years of the design life. So an economist could come up with a completely different number and they could probably come up with several completely different numbers if they if they wanted to look at it and show you a lot of different options as far as interest rates and inflation and all things go. But but this is just to give you a way to compare things over time. It's not, it's not the most accurate, but it's consistent across the board here. We're, we're taking that total project cost, dividing by the, the number of years of the design life. Um, and let's see. Again, town share in here. Um, construction duration. There, there we're trying to get the total. Um, construction duration, not the duration of closure. And I don't think I have that in the table. I think I have that, but but we are shooting for sixty days. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Two months, not three months. Let me catch up. When we started, when we started this whole process with the trans, we were in the days. And we essentially got it down to sixty days. So, um, so the, the the bottom line summary here. Um, we're looking for a construction start in 2025, and with this recommended alternative, 3.4 million um, total cost estimate, town share 170,000. And that's calculated based on inflation and all that for uh, the next four years. I don't want to take into consideration that four years from now. You no, I'm not going to. Yeah. I'm not going to try to help with that number. That's our best guess at the moment. You know, if, if you take the the inflation we've seen over the last ten year period, I think this is a reasonable number. But but what's going on right now with the current construction price uh, adjustments? And you said that was a project. That was a free cap on three structures. Correct. That's what we write down. Okay, now we're on the next step. Can you talk about that? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, can, I, can I see if anyone in the public, if there's yeah. anyone that wants to comment before we move on? Any questions? Right. Uh, is, there, is there any closure on Lincoln uh, Street? No, we could go to the meeting that we can hear. Yeah. Um, I'll just mention I have reviewed dozens of these spoken reports with bridges. Um, and I think had a very thorough job. Um, I would like to know the alternative as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And from pedestrian and bicycle lanes point of view, I like to walk the wider bicycle lane to find to accommodate people who would like to put more and more in the street. Thank you. Um, could you describe a bit more in detail about how the bridge is being widened? Is it being widened on both sides or more on the upstream side or the downstream side? We're actually trying to split the difference right there and, and, and widen both directions equally or more or less equally. So um, even, even though we're adding that traffic, the, that traffic lane essentially to the Go Street traffic, um, the the bridge length along the stream will kind of grow from the center of where it is now. So it's okay. And how much wider is it going to be? Um, 
What's the current fee? And yeah. what what will be the <clears throat> Let me do the math on that number and I'll share that for you. Um, and right now, uh, by the way, we live at 116 Stone Street, which is the first house on Stone Street. So yeah, that's why we're so concerned about the details here. Um, and the sidewalk right now goes on, as you said, the wrong, the wrong side or the downhill side. Downstream side mm -hmm. and comes up by our house. Is that it looks like you know just from your diagrams that that's going to be partially eliminated or you know I'm not sure where it's going to end. It looks like they're going to be taking part of that sidewalk for a lane. Yeah, it's it's not it's not going to be that's correct. That's correct. A, a, a portion of that that sidewalk will be become part of the traffic lane. Uh, sure. So the sidewalk will essentially be cut back, will be shortened. Yes, it will. Now, as, as far as the, whether the limits of the sidewalk are maintained in front of your, is this your property right here? Yeah, that is that. That's okay. Um, we, we have not, you know, put put any design effort into right into I whether we want to maintain I this portion or not. Or right. Um, but I, but I think we we can certainly address that. Yeah. Part of the yeah. What is the confirm you know yeah. what it looks like? Since that was dead end basically in front of your house, mm -hmm. what what's your What's your opinion on what you would like to see with the sidewalk that's in front of your house? It would um, not really have a path. Well, well, my wife's concern would be a little bit in front of her, but, you know. But I mean, that's the right now that sidewalk was reconstructed a few years ago, and you know, I um, I mean, I think we would like to maintain it in front of our porch. So you can walk off your porch and get over to that crossing. Right. Okay. You know, it's actually between our 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 house and the. I mean, that sort of open lawn until we have less. You know, this one and that. Okay. I'm working on moving the footage here. Just want to make sure that we do it. Anything else to uh, move on to anyone? Anyone else with any comments? Yeah, uh, I do. Oh. So I am concerned that you're underestimating the number of people that are using the right now. Yes. Um, that you know, walking across, uh, cycling across, and on it. Uh, so I would you know, uh, recommend they figure out a way to get a pedestrian crossing in place there. Uh, During construction. I think that. There, there has to be a way to uh, safely pass people through construction sites. It happens all the time. Um, so I don't really think that's a, a valid objection. Uh, and uh, I, I just think there's, there's a lot of people across that bridge that aren't being taken into account. So that is something that the town can consider um, when you're deciding which alternative you want to go with. It does increase the cost of the town, uh, doubles the cost of the town. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, that ultimately, we're not going to force a closure on you guys. We're not going to force, um, it's ultimately up to the town to decide. But it is a, it's a substantial cost difference. So it's something to take into consideration. Just to be clear, I mean, what you're clearly saying right now, 60 days would be the closure time. So 60 days is the closure time. Our typical construction season is uh, like mid May through October. And so once this gets into design, um, Jonathan will work with the town to determine uh, what 60 days that is. So you can take any 60 days, any 60 consecutive days 
um, between that window. So it could be, it seems like Bill was concerned with um, school, school bus routes possibly. So it could be, you know, June 15th. I don't know when your school season ends, but it's usually around that time. That's when the 60 days could end, but there's, um, that, that's something that will work on the calendar. Yeah, and, and not trying to complete the entire construction <clears throat> in that 60 days, but trying to have it reopen the traffic and then pedestrian traffic after that 60 days. Mm -hmm. So it might still not have the final pavement on it, it might not have all the rails right. on it, but, but it, 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 would, it, would, it would have the, the lanes available for the traffic to start moving again and a, a, an area for the pedestrian and cyclists. So the 60 days is the complete shutdown. Is, is correct. There's right. the the that, that's that's when you don't have connectivity. Right. Other than that, it might be rough, but it would be nice. Right. Right. Okay. I think maybe the town are looking to what necessity pedestrian traffic versus um, enjoyment pedestrian traffic is crossing that bridge in that short 60 day period, figure out some alternative to get those necessities to where they need to be back and forth. Then joy walkers can just have to find an alternative for, for 60 days other than incurring an enormous cost to the town for those you know, short stint of 60 days. Right, I was wondering if we could figure out like a volunteer and or, or trying to get people to take some work. Yep. So at some point we need to work putting out some information to people who need to use that access to get to work by foot and uh, you know, have them sign up so we know who needs to get back and forth and when do we need to make decisions on <laughs> Seems like the pedestrian thing is, is one of the main conversations we're probably gonna have to have. When do we need to make those kinds of decisions? So it doesn't have to be tonight. It doesn't need to be just the next select board meeting. I mean, you can um, it, it, you know, do a pedestrian study to figure out the pedestrian issues. Um, and you can you can take a couple months. The you know if you, this goes out six months. If you're taking a year to make a decision, there's um, definitely a possibility that that 2025 construction can move out to 2026. Um, but certainly, you don't need to make a decision tonight. Um, but I would I would recommend you know in the next in the next couple months, you would definitely want to do that. Laura, I would just add that I'll be working with the town and engineers to refine that closure period as well. I mean, we like to come in here and, you know, we don't want to over promise and under deliver, but I'm pretty confident we can shave a few days off of that too. We can do an incentive for the contractor. Um, we can choose what substantial completion needs to look like for that closure duration. So, like uh, Tom was saying, you know, maybe there's no pavement on the road and we reopen it and then we do a couple of night closures to finish pavement, um, but it's still open for those two quality reasons and over time. So there's some things we can look at as we get farther in design and we really know what the details are going to be. Um, you know, we're still so conceptual with our promises, things, but we're confident we can get 60 days. I'm pretty confident we can do better. Um, I drive across that twice a day every day. So you know I'm destined to work hard for you guys. Um, and and also one thing that you can note is if the town suffers chooses an alternative, you know, to get the five percent, that's the, the next step. Uh, finance and maintenance agreement that I work to execute with you guys, um, which basically simplifies your funding. Um, so you pick your, your alternative, and if you choose to go without the need for it, you can then have the project duration to finalize how you want to accommodate that improvement. So some of these things can run concurrently as well. That 60 days, is that taken into consideration any weather delays? Yeah, it does, right? So it's okay. there, there's a uh, there are no considerations for weather, basically. Um, you get the days you get, and that's all the contractor gets. So um, we do factor in some, you know, contingency time. But but once we know what the alternative is, right now we're not sure if it's going to be a pre-patch structure or uh, you know 
still be inferior structure. So once we know exactly what the town selects an alternative to the structure, we can refine the design and get a better idea of what the structure is. Better. So those incentive disincentives, um, just to give you an idea of what that is. So for every um, day that the contractor completes the bridge ahead of schedule, we pay them money, we pay them extra money. And then for every, and I believe it's built by the hour that they, um, they don't need that 60 days, they need to pay us money. And I can say it's, it's worked in 99% of cases. We've done hundreds of bridge closures at this point, um, you know, very detailed uh, construction schedules laid out, um, you know, activity by construction activity by construction activity and um, all but one project, uh, the contractors met the date for that time duration, so. Any other questions or um, um, So next steps, I'm, I'm gonna send a response to the town probably tomorrow or the next day. I'm gonna be sending along um, a form that's gonna have all of the alternatives um, spelled out on that form and the town when you're ready, you can just check, you know, we want alternative 3A, 4A, whatever it is. Um, so we're waiting for uh, the town response to recommendation on the proposed project. Um, once we hear from the town on how you'd like to proceed, that's when we'll start um, developing conceptual plans. Uh, we'll distribute them to the town for comments. Uh, if everything looks good, um, we'll process the local agreement. So that's the finance and maintenance agreement. Um, at that point, that's when um, we'll start developing more plan sets. We go through the right of way process, which I believe it is going to be needed on this project. Um, and again, just a reminder the town is responsible for any closing of these bridges. Great. Questions. I, I actually have a follow up. So, but the question I was asked about this width. So, if my, if my numbers are correct here, it looks like we're adding 22 feet of width. 22? 20, yeah, 22. Two. Okay. Yeah. And you split by the center of the road. So trying, trying to keep it as close to the center of the road mm -hmm. as, as possible. Oh. So, so on um, center of the existing right way. So, 11 feet on each side. So yeah, that's, that's more or less what we're aiming for. Is to keep it like that. How many feet of river will be reclaimed in this project? Because again, we're seeing there's a oh for the long for the for the wider span. Right. Um, I'm not sure exactly on on that one either, but I think we're going to get at least five feet wider on each side. That might might be a little bit more. Yeah, because with flooding, that's such a big concern. <laughs> you have to, so you have a pinch point for that. Yeah, yeah, we we'll definitely want to keep that as open as possible. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. This was very well laid out. We appreciate it. Yes. I'll just mention so there's that link at the top of the page there. That's the project SharePoint site. So the scoping report's up at that site. There's a fact sheet up at that site. The next presentation will be up at that site. And all future plan submittals, so conceptual plans, preliminary plans, um, will all be posted on that website. It's a Public uh, public site that anybody can go to and that information. One last question: Will the stream width change under the bridge? We're not going to physically alter the stream to dig it out and open it up, but we'll take the existing um, structures out with this, with this alternative, okay. um, so that the stream will have more room to expand the track. It will have a bit more. It will have more room. Yes. Okay. Because I mean, you know, um, over days, when we have days of rain, you know, the, the height of that patch of road goes up by like really four to five feet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other ones? All right. So we'll make sure that we respond. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. For your patience. We know we're all behind. So. Um, next, we are moving on to interviews for CV Fiber Delegate and alter Alternate Delegate. I'm not sure. We have two people here in person and one person via Zoom. Oh, yeah. 
is there anyone facilitating the conversation surrounding what the roles and responsibilities of these delegates are? Steve, can you do that? Steve, uh, can you help sure. with that? Okay, thank you. Let me talk to the table here and uh, give a very brief overview of the name. So, um, CB Fiber is our uh, communications union district uh, that already exists. So, you've already decided to join, and the final step is to appoint a delegate and an alternate delegate. So, um, and the roles the, uh, the board of CB Fiber, my understanding is they meet monthly, and um, the delegates are tapped for a variety of uh, volunteer efforts. One might be uh, working on uh, design for a library and then one of the topics that we can take up another day. So I don't want to focus on the group. So okay. that's that's okay. really the bottom line. Thank you very much, Jeff. All right. We will start with Dennis. Come on up. Thank you for your patience. Hi. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Dennis, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, why you're interested in being a CB Fiber representative for one year? Well, I'm one of Mark's neighbors. So, uh, Mark put on a letter to us that uh, uh, I've been fairly involved in trying to get internet up on the road since I lived here. Uh, it's a real Challenging problem cost wise for our residents. I'm sure you all know that. And dealing with Comcast has been pretty frustrating. They, they use an alarming way to bring cable up anywhere. Um, so, anyway, uh, that's why I decided to volunteer. I, I know there was a call for volunteers initially. I didn't do anything about it. And then we got a letter from Walker. <coughs> College to volunteer anyway. I, my, my background is in science. I have a PhD in chemistry from UVM. Uh, in Toronto. I graduated in 1977. Um, and I spent my whole life working for SIBA, uh, driving pharmaceuticals which became Novartis Pharmaceuticals. You've heard of it, it's one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Uh, my role has been uh, mostly managing research, uh, managing large groups of people, uh, running development projects where we are spending large amounts of money trying to bring a drug to market. Uh, if you pay attention over the last year of the pandemic, you know drug development is uh, a lengthy process. Um, I, I've never done any vaccine yet, unfortunately. Um, that was out of my realm, but uh, um, I'm pretty familiar with dealing in uh, uh, project management type situations uh, with large numbers of people. And, uh, on the technology side, I, that's how I've done my new life. So I, I'm comfortable with uh, technology issues. Fairly quickly. Yeah. But I have no experience in uh, uh, internet design or anything like that. It's, it's, it's just a project. Mm -hmm. you know. right. Any questions? And apparently, in the board, we were going to have money to do that. <laughs> yeah, um, do you know what the number of potential properties that this hopefully would help to address? I, I don't have the data, Mark. Um, I know um, there there is CD fiber data that we can access and we can get back to on that for underserved um, numbers of connections right now, but I don't have the number. Okay. It's significant. Is it large in the area? Well, it's better in Waterbury because we have Comcast cable than it is on a uh, fair, not in every part of Waterbury, not the Ring Road. <laughs> but, you know, the majority of the, the community is served, is served by Comcast. But that's not fire. No, but it's, it meets the speed 
uh, criteria, I, I understand it's a speaking party, but that, those are the kind of issues that I think the delegate, the open delegate, will get into with um, the speaking party board and, and so on. And so I, I solved my problem because I went to the spiral from my house to the Mountain Mountain pretty far, so I have a clear view, but it, that really needs to work in general areas, I think, because of the the need for a clear view of the spot. Yeah. There's a significant open cost to that as well, right? $550? Yeah. And then the monthly amount. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I have experience with fiber optics. I should mention oh, yeah. where <laughs> I lived in New Jersey because it was Verizon's headquarters. They put fiber optics to every house in the township. Um, and then knock on their doors and say, Would you like to have five years? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Yeah, definitely. Five years. Where to go with it today? Um, any questions from the board? Sounds like you got a lot of experience in a lot of different areas, Dennis. But uh, do you have any experience in harvest listing? It seems like uh Comcast, everybody has problems with Comcast. Um, well, I, I, I don't know what it is about their company, but uh, getting them to do anything is like pulling teeth. In fact, yeah. we, we they make uh, a lot of money. You know, they make a lot of money, and they we, it seems like they don't do a lot for it. I mean, once they get their infrastructure in, I mean, the town right now has had to extend their contract, get them to move their lines off the poles here so we can pull the poles down to Main Street. Oh, yeah. They're the last ones. We knew that going into this, you know, deal that they were going to be problematic. Yeah. And in fact, <clears throat> they have kind of gone over over the line in being problematic. And uh, so it, I think that's going to be a huge number one issue. Is Are they going to be the supplier of the internet? I don't yeah, think no, it would not be no. healthcare. Yeah. It would be a separate system. That's good. So, what part, of the, what role do they play in this one, Steve? Who? Comcast? Yeah. I don't think, I think this would be tied into a fiber line that's coming from Stowe. Potentially from Stowe. Okay. Yeah, it's a separate system. It's a separate system altogether. It's DB5 as well. And they showed a map in one of our meetings that was. Because I think our underserved area is Upper Sweet, Sweet Road area, Rain, and then I can't remember where the other houses were. So who's going to be running the lines? Is it? Well, they would have a contract. Yeah, I think maybe in another meeting we can get involved in all that. Experience. I would recommend you yeah. go through the interview process. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, talk tech, tech, we'll get somebody in here to talk to you about technical. Maybe Jeremy has to talk to you about the technical side. I apologize. No, it's okay. I, just, I don't know. Misunderstanding. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and we will let you know we will be picking a delegate in the office. Okay. So we'll you know where to find Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Before it's yeah. Linda? Yeah. Linda? Thank you for your patience as well. Um, Introduce yourself and tell us what you're interested in being a delegate. My name is Linda Gravel. I live in Northern Center. Uh, I'm interested in public service, and that's why I'm running. I think I have expertise in this area and education in this area. And so I will go through the different things that I have to offer. Um, my first I'll talk about is my education. I have a bachelor's degree from Northeastern University in math and computer science and education. Um, I had a double major there. I also have a master's degree from Rensselaer um, in a computer technology and management. Um, my experience is that I've been a software developer. I have um, worked on hardware. Um, um, for example, I wired school systems with internet um, capability. Um, I uh, worked for Sovernet Communications uh, when they were doing the broadband installation in southern Vermont. So 
So as part of that activity, I also work for Hacker Shield, which is a cybersecurity um, company. Um, I ran the East Coast office at that company. Um, I consider myself um, a software developer, um, engineering project manager, and um, I think all this experience that I have um, working with um, internet already will come in quite handy with this job. Um, let's see what else I have to offer. Oh, public service. Um, I'm currently a justice for peace. I'm a volunteer with Stowe and Library Schools in P programs because I'm a P instructor. And I, um, I collect donations for the Vermont Food Bank um, as one of my public services. And I am the Democratic County Chair for Washington County, where I do a lot of uh, negotiations, you might say. <laughs> so now this is kind of handy. Any questions for me? A couple of questions. Where did you do your software development company? Did you do software development before? You mentioned that. Um, okay. How long have you lived in Waterburg? Five years. Five years. Thank you. Impressive background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you mean you spare time? <laughs> <laughs> She's retired. Now. That's right, I'm retired. The difference between retirement and I know that being a right. happy career is that one you get paid for, and the other one you work and you don't. <laughs> I know that feeling. Yeah. Um, I also think that it's um, a good thing to have diversity on this committee, and I think that the female may will bring diversity to this committee. Thank you very much. Any additional questions? Well, thank you for your consideration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. And I believe Christopher, you are via Zoom, correct? Yes. I, I apologize. I'm <clears throat> I'm kind of under the weather, and I didn't want to bring that into uh, to a public place. So thank you for having me. No problem. Um, thank you for that. Same <laughs> same thing. If you heard the other interviews, just tell us a little about yourself, your background, what your interest is. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, although I have to say. <laughs> Following Linda may be a little difficult. Um, and also, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, as as we're here to discuss, my internet is a challenge, so I apologize if I cut it in and out. But uh, um, yeah, a little bit about my myself. Um, I've been uh, in technology my entire career. Um, I, I actually started in in a training program for a high speed internet company uh, down in Florida, where I'm originally from. And I got into software development from there um, and really enjoyed doing that. Uh, I, then, I then shifted gears a bit and went to uh, Goldman Sachs um, out in, uh, in Utah in Salt Lake City. And I, 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 um, I worked on a team, <clears throat> uh, it's called DevOps, which is sort of um, halfway in between a, an IT role and a software development role, uh, I guess you could say. And, and I did that for a while before moving back home to, to Florida um, where I ended up, um, running the IT team for um, for a software company, a healthcare software company. And um, I did that for a number of years. And so, in, you know, in, in that experience, I, I worked with a lot of different cell phone providers. We had, um, we had four different campuses that all had primary and secondary internet. Um, and so, you know, I worked with a lot of different companies, a wide variety of companies, um, fiber, cable, uh, and, and more. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, um, then uh, you know, my, my family and I, we, um, we are Floridians, but um, um, we're glad to be from Florida, but we don't want to live there. So we actually um, intentionally looked to, to move um, to move somewhere else. And uh, so I started pursuing um, a job in, uh, in the Burlington, Vermont area. And um, I ended up becoming the director of technology for VITAL, which is Vermont's health information exchange. Um, and I've done that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've done that for the last, um, or for about two years, I, 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 um, I worked for, for Vital, um, and um, we, we've absolutely fallen in love with Vermont and decided that this is where we want to stay. Uh, and so we recently purchased our first Vermont house um, here in Waterbury. Um, we moved in <clears throat> in the beginning of April, and at the same time, 
Um, I was actually recruited by uh, another um, financial company, software financial company. Um, they're based out of New York City, but we have mostly a remote workforce. And for them, I'm the head of IT. And so again, I, I deal with um, uh, internet um, and, and many other technologies um, for our company. And um, yeah, and so, you know, a little bit of uh, personal background, you know, my, my family and I have really fallen in with, fallen in love with Vermont and um, we're very happy to have found Waterbury and a, and a house here in Waterbury, uh, Waterbury. And <clears throat> it's actually my view is my, my background and very proud of, mm -hmm. proud of that. Um, but the, the one sticking point for us was um, uh, just terrible, terrible internet um, options. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough that um, I know technologies and I have, I have a very fancy home network that allows me to take the multiple terrible internet options that I have and sort of combine them into one mediocre uh, option. Um, but it's still, you know, most, most people don't have that, that luxury. Um, and I want to, I want to give back to the community that I have recently adopted. And, and that's, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hoping to do. And, and uh, in fact, you know, I was, I, I've been here the whole meeting and, and uh, I've enjoyed, you know, learning about the bridge project and, and other things. Um, and right as we were starting to go into this process, my wife decided that she was going to watch TV and I had to go tell her to stop because I can't do this Zoom call and watch TV at the same time, which I think is. Uh, so it's certainly something that I, um, I, I feel personally, but <clears throat> I'm, I'm off obviously very fortunate that I, I can deal with this problem myself. And I'm sure there's a, there's a, a much larger underserved community that, that doesn't have the the tools available to, to deal with that. And I'd, I'd like to help in any way I can. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, questions from the board. What are your current internet provider? So I, I have um, I have consolidated DSL at seven megabit by 700 megabit. That's my primary. Um, and, uh, and then I also have a T-Mobile hotspot with a hundred gigs of data. Um, and then my home network allows for uh, two internet connections and, and it load balances between them. And so if one fails, the other one can pick up. And I was affected by the power outage last night. Uh, mm -hmm. And thankfully I was able to, uh, my, my um, hotspot is on, uh, does work on a battery for about eight hours, so. So Comcast does not serve your home either? No, um, but I did. I did reach out to them, um, and they were willing to serve my house for just over thirteen thousand dollars. Okay. Where in Waterbury are you located? I'm. Uh, I'm just off of two, um, pretty far west, almost to Bolton. Um, so if you go past the fairgrounds uh, and then go back under the interstate, um, on the right hand side, there's a little road with three houses, and I'm one of the three. Mm -hmm. All right. Any additional questions for Chris? Thank you very much. Um, we'll be making a decision and let you know. Um, we need to pick a, a main delegate and alternative. So. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, do we want to make a decision tonight, or do we want? What's the time frame on? There is a board meeting coming up. Uh, bear with me. I brought my notes. Um, August 9th, Tuesday, August 9th, yeah. is the board meeting. It would be yeah. awesome if you could make a decision tonight. Okay. If you want to point out one suggestion, you can go through your other business and come back to this possibly. Okay. Um, do we have other guests? Do we want to do that? And yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. great. And we will move on then to the Act 250 discussion. Thank you for your patience. We you apologize for being oh, here. Is, uh, the bridge project is very interesting. I, mm -hmm. I find that fascinating. Great. I live in Meadowcrest, so mm -hmm. I am one of the people that occasionally walks across the road, mostly drives across it. So it's nice to see you doing that project. Um, cool. Well, uh, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, and, and we've got John as well. Um, they're both from Cliff, and I'll let you explain what Cliff is. So for those who don't know me, I'm Duncan McDougall. Um, and I live in Waterbury Center on Loomis Hill. And uh, almost 25 years ago, I started a nonprofit out of my home called the Children's Literacy Foundation. You may have seen my red car driving around with a smiley face on it. And um, we have 
work over the past 23 years with uh, more almost 350,000 kids across Vermont, New Hampshire. Our target audience is low income, at risk, and rural kids from birth to age 12 for every inch of the two states. Low income housing developments, uh, homeless shelters, working with refugee kids, migrant kids, work in prisons to connect inmates with their kids through literacy, work in schools, libraries, etc. It's a long list. So long story short, um, we have been working above my garage on Lewis Hill, and um, we work wherever the kids are. So we don't have any kids coming to us. Uh, we just have a little office where we organize all of these events. And um, over time, we just run out of space. So we're looking for, uh, after 23 years, a new office. And uh, we love Waterbury, Waterbury Center, and we absolutely want to stay here. Our staff members live around here. They want to stay here. And um, after more than two years of searching, we found the location of the old flat um, property, which is kind of across from Old Hollow Cider, where the building burned down. It used to be the auction block. Um, and so we had a purchase and sale agreement with the Graces, with uh, John and, and Robert Grace. And our sincere hope is that that will be um, our new location. Um, one challenge for us as a small nonprofit is that it's a 1.4 acre property, um, and yet uh, we would have to go through Act 250 under the current guidelines. And most towns in Vermont um, have a 10 acre um, limit, and here it's one acre, even though Waterbury has um, zoning. So, is the question that we wanted to raise it's going to be financially challenging for us actually to go through Act 250? It's going to time wise, it's going to slow us way down. And so we thought we'd raise that issue. And I'm here with John Petrowski, uh, PCE Engineering. We hired um, his firm uh, to do the engineering course and the permitting. And in a second after John speaks, we'll hear from John Vogel. Uh, John is a board member of the Children's Literacy Foundation, and he is the chair of our building committee. So I'm going to pass it over to John. So I'll be really brief. I actually came and met with this board maybe three years ago. I knew you were here, Chris. And we had a conversation about Act 250, and that's all this is tonight. There's no pressure. We're not, I, I think we're asking you to think about it, to talk about it, um, and perhaps consider um, not being a one acre town. And that maybe is not a decision you make. Maybe that starts here and goes to the Planning Commission and others to, to get us there. But um, I came and talked to you because we were going through a project a few years ago, the Perot gun shop. And so we had the benefit of going through that project with Act 250. And I have the, I've come out on the other side and I can give you a little bit of insight as to how that went. I know there was an article in the Free Press about it and I printed it out today, but essentially they spent an extra 10% on the project, uh, extra $120,000 to go through Act 250 when you think about the application fees, um, all of the engineering to prepare plans, and, uh, and to go through that process. And then um, in addition to that, it created you know, months of extra review time and more hearings. What I found interesting about that project was that Waterbury has an amazing DRB. They reviewed the project in detail and permitted it and later on, when we went through Act 250, there was essentially no changes. The project the DRB approved that went through the scrutiny of this office or, or the town of Waterbury, uh, it's pretty much the project we built. Um, we still had to get a stormwater permit, a water supply permit, a wastewater permit, the local approval, but we had to do that anyway. And uh, Act 250 was really more a clearinghouse um, the other really um, kind of unfortunate thing that happened with the Perot project, and you'll be exposed to this potentially as well, is that D-Train showed up and they said, because you're an Act 250 project, we can ask you to help pay for road improvements on the state highways. And so they came up with, initially, with something that was $45,000. They wanted a check to help pay for some of the... Uh, um, projects that were fully funded by the federal government, complete, but weren't complete for a time frame that um, allowed it to be um, you know, not an issue. And so VTRANS um, asked for 45,000, 
Uh, we negotiated in good faith with them and with uh, Phil Sheflock got involved. He helped us a little bit on that because it was kind of a surprise, you know, uh, surprise extra bill. And uh, fortunately, they negotiated down to 6,500 and, and we agreed in good faith and the process ended. And, and Henry Perot paid that fee. But they started with something that was scary, 45,000 on top of what um, Henry Perot had already spent. So that's kind of the other side of a project that, you know, I had that conversation with this board beforehand, and then we went through Act 250, and that's the experience we had. It, it really didn't change the project, but it added a lot of burden and cost. So in the case of Cliff, which is a nonprofit, you know, we are paying attention to cost. And we wanted to have that discussion a few years later now to see if maybe um, we've reached the point of where um, Act 250 doesn't have to be a one acre town anymore. And Steve probably could explain this better than anybody, but if, if towns have permanent zoning and subdivision rules, then Act 250 says for commercial projects under 10 acres, there is no jurisdiction. Um, for towns that don't have permanent zoning and subdivision rules, it's one acre. In the case of three particular towns, Benson, Brandon, and Waterbury, um, the town has made the decision to remain a one acre town, which is the town's right to do that. And all I would say about Waterbury zoning is it's, it's not the best, it's not the worst, it's pretty solid. You know, it's middle of the middle of the pack I deal with I've been doing this 38 years. So I dealt with a lot of regulations and Waterbury's rigs are thorough and that project didn't change. Um, that's one good experience. You know, that's one example. Maybe there's some projects that Act 250 really mattered. You know, uh, when I heard about Act 250 and I started my career, it was really about regional impacts and protecting towns that didn't have zoning. And it was important, and I believe in Act 250. That's why our state's so beautiful. And um, the gentleman was just speaking. That's why he wanted to come to Vermont, is because we are a beautiful state. And I've been to some states that don't have Act 250 and and and, and allow just anything to happen, and it's terrible. Um, so I, it's not. I'm not against Act 250. I work with them all the time, and I do many projects. But it's a cost to benefit analysis. And is the cost to Cliff or in the case of Henry Perot, is that cost worth the benefit that the community is gaining? And I think it's all I ask that you just think about it and give it some consideration. And um, we're probably we're probably several months before we even get to the point of applying for Act 250, but it could add 10% to the cost. And for a nonprofit, that's a big chunk of money. So that's I'm being brief because I know this is late um, and John is part of Cliff. So John, maybe you could just uh, say hello and, and offer a brief uh, statement. Yeah, thank you, John. And thank you to the members of the select board who have to stay quite late tonight. And I will also be brief. And I want to pick up where John left off, which is uh, I taught at Tuck for 26 years. And one of the things I always spent time with my students on was doing a cost benefit analysis in every decision you make, you know, what's the cost, what's the benefits. Um, as John indicated for Cliff, the, the benefits of going through Act 250 are relatively small. The costs both in time and in um, money is substantial. Um, I would argue that for the state of Vermont, and that's something we ought to think about. The cost benefit analysis is also not very favorable. In this case, we're talking about a very small project um, that where, you know, we have right now a lot of construction going on in Vermont. It's clogged. When I talk to construction managers like Naylor and Breen, they say, you know, you have to go through a series of departments there and each one is going to take the maximum time. If they have 60 days before they have to start the project, they take 60 days because the system is so clogged up. And to throw yet another project that I think anybody who looked at this objectively could say 
is not going to, um, you know, run into anything, any, any issues, but to clog up the system with it, you know, as a taxpayer in Vermont, I'm not happy about that. Um, and then I look at it from Waterbury's standpoint, and I say, you know, you have a professional. You have Steve, um, I can't pronounce his last name, but it begins with an L, who's, who's more knowledgeable about Act 250 than any of us. And I think he could do you the cost-benefit analysis for the town of Waterbury. And I think what he would say in this case is, you know, there are some things that aren't covered by by the town zoning and planning, um, like traffic studies. But in this case, you know, do you really need a traffic study? In fact, we've already talked to the Vermont Department of Transportation, and they're saying, no, we don't. We don't really want you to do a traffic study. We can just see there are five cars a day coming there. It's not going to change the traffic on that. And he could say, here are the other things that aren't covered by the local zoning. And that's, that's, you know, that's, that's what we'll get. That's the benefit we'll get about pushing you through Act 250. And here are the costs. Big costs to, to anybody who wants to do a project here in town. What I would recommend is that, you know, to conform to the rest of the states in Vermont, we say, okay, if the project is 10 acres, no question, has to go through Act 250. If it's less than one acre, should should never go through Act 250. And if it's somewhere between one and 10 acres, then let's let our professionals um, like Steve do this kind of cost benefit analysis and say, in this case, it makes a lot of sense. In other cases, it doesn't make sense. You know, I'm a volunteer like all of you. And one of the great advantages of being a volunteer is you can use your common sense. And you can look at a project like this and say, you know, common sense says we're not going to get any benefits out of pushing them through Act 250, and we're going to impose significant costs. I mean, there are kids who won't get books because we want to, you know, get some paperwork done at, at the state level. Again, I would, you know, urge you to use Steve to, to determine when does it make sense to push a little project like this through Act 250? Is there anything controversial? Is there anything to be gained? And what's the cost? And make a decision on that basis. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Mark? Yeah. yeah um, I think this, Steve is probably still there. I think John, uh, you know, makes good sense, but I'm not sure we get to pick and choose. I think we either are or we're not. Um, you know, I don't think that we can say, well, Steve's going to do a cost benefit analysis and this project has to go through Act 250, but another one doesn't. Um, we have an ordinance uh, that requires our development of this nature, of this size parcel to go through Act 250. I think it's either on or off. Uh, so I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't change this ordinance, but I don't think we can do what John Vogel just said and pick one that's going to go to Act 250 and another one that isn't going to go. And I'll defer to Steve if he's still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah he's going to come to the table. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Bill. So since since I was um, addressed, I think I better speak to you. So um, I don't do cost benefit analysis, John. Uh, it's not my job. And also, I'm a facilitator. Um, I don't make the decisions about development review. It's the decisions of the development review board. So I think I, I just want to be clear about my role in, in this. Um, there are situations where the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission makes decisions about which projects have regional significance. And in some cases, they have decided that projects between one and ten acres have regional significance. So I think I think we have to be careful there. But um, can you explain that? Like what, what that uh, what the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission yeah, does? What that what that comment, what does that mean? Regional significance. Yeah. Well, so so the, uh, this is a little bit of a sideline, but I'll try to be brief. So um, all projects get referred to the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. They have to decide if under the Central Vermont Regional Plan, 
does this project rise to a level of significance either because of natural resource impacts or because of some other impact, impact on historic resources, something of that nature. Often it has to do with natural resource impacts. So, any project or one that's between the one and ten? Well, no, it could be any project. Typically, they would be a larger project, but but it might be one. So, um, so I think it's important uh, since the cost benefit was raised. Um, and Act 250 came into being in 1970. Uh, it was largely due to pressure in southern Vermont of development coming up from the south. And um, I think I don't think we should look at this strictly through a lens of cost benefit. I don't think that is the way um, from a planning perspective. And Alyssa Johnson is here. She's the chair of our planning commission. And I certainly would invite you to come up, Alyssa, and um, speak on behalf of the planning commission if you wish. But um, I think it's important to understand that uh, Act 250 came into being um, in order to help preserve the quality of the environment in Vermont. And I think it's still primarily there. So, um, so I think we have to be very careful. Uh, I, as I say, I don't do cost benefit analysis, so I can't speak to the economics of this. I certainly empathize with the cost of development. There are many, many costs of development. This is only one factor, and I, I realize it can be it can be significant. But um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, the the trigger for moving from a one acre to a town ten acre town for commercial activity is the addition of subdivision regulations. So um, there are many municipalities in Vermont that have zoning regulations that are still one acre towns, especially smaller municipalities, that don't have subdivision bylaws. So when we enacted subdivision bylaws or a chapter in our zoning for subdivision in 2012, that um, is where the determination was made that those uh, were equivalent to subdivision regulations. And um, that's when the stress issue came up and um, the select board at the time in 2013 decided there were concerns about the level of our uh, site plan review criteria, uh, of conditional use criteria in some of the areas that were mentioned, traffic, um, historic uh, sites and historic districts. We have uh, actually six historic districts plus individually listed historic sites in Waterbury. Are, we're very limited in how our regulations address that. And there may be other areas. There are 10 criteria and many sub criteria in Act 50. So uh, I'm not an expert, but I've taken municipal projects through Act 50, and I understand the, the cost is, can be uh, severe. So that, that's really all I had to say for clarification. And uh, did you want to mention anything? Of course, Bill. Yes, go ahead. So I don't think you answered my question, Steve. I understand. Okay. You know, uh, you don't, do cost benefit, you don't do cost benefit analysis. I understand that. But if the select board rescinds this ordinance, then we become a 10 acre town and we, uh, we then will review for Act 250 on all these projects between one and, and 10 acres. The Regional Planning Commission may be able to say, hey, we, we recommend to the district commission that you take authority for something, but it's not on a case by case basis. It's either we have the ordinance or we don't, correct? That, that's, that's correct. And I would agree with that too. <laughs> yeah, you were correct, Bill. So um, that's correct. But there would be no, um, no local Act 250 review either on the um, projects between one and 10 acres. We cannot apply Act 250 criteria to development, we would apply the criteria in our site review and it, it would be it would be the development review board would do the review. Act 250 wouldn't be involved unless it was 10 right. acres. And then, yeah, at, at that's, all, that's correct. So but, the ordinance that we have now, we're a one acre town because of that ordinance, because we have uh, subdivision regulations. If the select board want to change this, and, and they may, you'd have to rescind that ordinance. Uh, you can't do that. Well, you could do it tonight, I guess, but I wouldn't recommend that you do it. And it takes uh, 60 days for 
uh, a new ordinance to take effect. So it, it will take several months to get this ordinance um, discontinued if that's what the board wants to do. But I just wanted to be clear that we are or will not enact a, a, a 10 acre town. We can't, it's not on a case by case basis. Yeah, that, you're absolutely correct, Bill. So could, could, the, could the town of Waterbury decide to be a five-acre town? That's, That's what I was going to ask. Does one attend the only threshold? Well, correct. The, my understanding is that the the um, state statute that allows us to have an ordinance um, states that we can remain a one-acre town, but we don't we don't have a choice of some other option. It's one or ten. Either we move at ten or we're at eight. Just, just as an aside, towns like Bolton, based in Middlesex, Berlin, they made the decision they're ten acre towns. So there's some towns that are a lot less sophisticated than Waterbury that are that have already made this decision. Um, there's, like I said, there's only three towns in the state of Vermont that have made the decision once they pass the subdivision rules to stay a one acre town, and that's Benson, Brandon, and Waterbury as of uh, the list I just reviewed that's current as of April, 2021. Um, from the Act 250 standpoint, I'm pretty tight with Susan Baird, and you know, her take on it is they're happy to help. You know, they're, they're public servants, but with the pandemic and the project load they have, um, it's a burden. It's, it's extra work for them. In the case of the Perot gun shop, it was a, it was a duplication and a lot of effort. And, um, you know, it's not something we're asking you to decide tonight. We just wanted to open the discussion. Um, I started this discussion three years ago and, you know, maybe the time is, is right now to, to consider it from a practical standpoint, even though he can't do the cost to benefit analysis, I know that this board thinks that way. That's the way you're thinking with the bridge project. I heard it. And it's 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 a balancing act. Do you get something out of Act 250? You sure do. Yeah. It, I mean, being a one acre town does give you some extra review, uh, second set of eyes. I get it. It's not it's not terrible, but there's a lot of added cost. And in the case of Cliff, it would it would be an extra burden. Um, and so we thought we'd open this discussion again. What's Cliff's project timeline? Uh, our hope is to start construction next spring, if all goes well. But, um, you know, as anyone knows who's gone through Act 250, that timing is really hard to predict. So, we'll so based on that piece of property, there's no existing type um, regulatory system. In other words, the fact that it was already occupied with the building had certain, I guess, guidelines or criteria that that property, I mean, it was a, it was a car dealership years and years ago. It was an auction barn, you know, years ago. Uh, the traffic flow was for the, for the days that in history that it was, it probably was as so, much of a traffic flow then as you would consider now of today, you know what I mean? So, so those uses predated Act 250, so they're they're going to consider it based on a proposal today. And uh, it's interesting, uh, the DRB approved that site for I think seven or eight units, a pretty eight units, a pretty good sized building. They're coming, they're proposing a building that's essentially going to be the size of a house, uh, a little bit bigger. Twenty nine hundred. Yeah, that's that's what I my point I was getting at. I mean, the, the fact that you're going in with what you're going in with, you would think that there'd be some huge consideration. I, it, it may be that the Act two fifty process goes quickly and smoothly. It may be, um, but it will be a cost. It will be a it will be a factor. And I'm I'm not objecting to what. Cliff and John are, are asking. I would just point out though that you can't use Cliff as the measuring stick. That Cliff is slightly more than an acre. Uh, it's going to be low impact. We've got places up the road that are going to be, you know, that are for sale now. And uh, it's in the wildlife corridor. And, you know, maybe so I understand Cliff's issue. 
And I don't want to put all the cliffs in the world necessarily through that, but it's, you can't use cliffs, really low impact situation as the barometer to measure this request. Because there's a lot of properties that can be developed that are between one and 10 acres that this would apply to. So um, just keep that in mind. And do we worry about those, the, um, the steps that we have in place already between um, the DRB and the regional uh, commission, can we recall? Do we worry, oh, it's just for Bill, but that we don't have enough in place to make those decisions without Act 250? Like we talk about it being in the wildlife corridor, but do we have enough steps along the way without Act 250 to feel confident that we're not disrupting or causing you know huge impact? Or are we worried that we don't, do you know any is it questions there? In the case of in the case of Henry Perot's project, and that's you know everything that we did, we had to we had to do the wetlands, the stormwater, um, the river corridor, the floodplain. We had to address all of that anyway. I think a lot of that we had to address as part of the DRB review. We really didn't do anything extra um, that Act 250 brought to the table, other than the traffic that came up, and actually. They didn't impose any requirements. They just wanted, they just wanted their blood. They wanted that money. So, um, what, what is the potential in a traffic study scenario? It's a potential to say you need to turn lane. You have to put in a turn lane. No, 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 no. They, it, my humble understanding of it is, and I only went through it once, uh, surprisingly, with the Pro project. But when it's an Act 250 project, they can look at other VTRANS projects in the neighborhood. And they can impose a fee to help you participate in the, that those expenses. Yeah, so I was going to ask about that forty-five thousand yeah. dollars. So they they judge that um, we should pay based on our trips a fee for I think that was for the roundabout project, and not the positive impact fee. It was an impact fee, right? But that impact is only because. <laughs> Only because the exactly project, if we were a 10 acre town, wouldn't have ever been considered for an impact fee. That is absolutely correct. If right. we were a town, then. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I, I mean, it was for the roundabout. I argued very uh, vociferously against the imposition of that fee. It was frankly an impact fee that was being applied retroactively. Towns can't do that. If towns, if towns have impact fees, you have to collect. You have to collect the fee now for something that you're going to do in the future. You can't collect the fee to pay for something you've already done. And that's what the state was doing. And I pointed out, I said, look, if, if the guy across the street develops his property and it doesn't need an Act 250 permit, and he might have 200 cars a day, but he's under an acre and doesn't need Act 250, you don't get any money out of him. And uh, I think maybe the letter that I wrote and the testimony that I gave helped knock the fee down from 45 to 6,500. But uh, it, it, you know, it's clearly not something that I would want. And where Cliff is, I mean, they're they're far away from the roundabout, but I don't know how far V trans would go back. They just, you know, we can. <laughs> we don't know either. I don't want to ask that question. So, 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 Bill. Oh. So, Bill, you just made our argument perfectly for us, which is, you know, you were there arguing when you get into state regulation and all the people will do is follow the rules and not use common sense, you end up, you know, penalizing projects. And now you're throwing us into Act 250, where we're going to be subject to whatever regulations they want to throw at us. I think you just made our argument better than I could. Steve, Vermont Artisan was another one that had this scenario, correct? There are seven acres site, correct. What yeah. in that project would have been different if we didn't have Act 250 in place, in your opinion? Like, I, yeah, I don't know, Mark. I mean, I, I can't really tell you. They still had to go through our, did, so when it goes to Act 250, it doesn't go through our DRB at all. It has to go through us and then Act 250, right? right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, Mark, well, maybe I could. Yeah. Sure. I was on the DRB for both the Vermont Artisan as well as the um, Paros project. I think we have a very good DRB with a lot of skills that can vet things out very effectively. 
the long-term implication. You have Cliff who, yes, and I hear what Bill's saying very loud and clear is that we don't want to pick and choose projects. You know, Cliff's is probably a great project. You know, it's probably something that the select board, the DRB is probably going to support, but there's probably going to be some other ones between one to 10 acres that might be a lot more controversial. So, but is it there for controversy? No, no. Well, it, it can be. No. Yes, it can. No, but my point is, is that I just feel like this, we have what we have in place to try to entice a certain amount of development. Either. 10 acre projects there's plenty of examples of towns that are able to take this on with less than what we have in the drb and planning and everything else that i just i i've had a problem with this for a while this is a great example of a concern i have for a project that just is over that one acre and potentially it's going to be difficult or who knows what we might run into along the way it just seems like we're doing a disservice for some of these projects to, you know, thank God bills in place so where the letter to try to get out of 45,000 and get it down to 6,500, but they still spent $6,500. And at the end of the day, you probably end up with a similar building with similar everything with the same grand list impact, but made them go through hoops that we have, the, we have the power to say 10 acres and above, you know? So like, it's unfortunate that they don't give us an option between I, I, I think we're all sitting here going, you was five, right. you know, yeah. or whatever, you know, but it's, and, and maybe that's a way to see, go to five and see how it goes. And then maybe in the 20 years, someone goes to 10 where we can make a decision and say, yeah. that's why statewide, there's a whole movement for Act 250 reform. You know, Act 250 is good for what it does, but sometimes it's, there's an overreach and there, if, if a, it gets a project so expensive, where it, it impacts, as, as you said, Mark. You know, that's where my concern is too. I'm concerned for the economic viability of small projects in our community. And I think it does affect, but I'm not, I don't think we're ready tonight to sure. make, to make uh, a decision. I'm not, so I'm not, not but if you, if you want the examples of some towns that, you know, there isn't a choice, you can't get right. five. If you could look at some of your neighbors mm -hmm. that are doing 10, and the burdens they face. I I really, you know, in my 38 years of doing this line of work, Act 250 makes a difference sometimes, but usually it's on the big projects, right. you know, a Shaw supermarket, uh, Costco, you know, the, the smaller projects under 10 acres, it has a minor impact sometimes. Maybe there's more landscaping, a prettier building, less lights, who knows, but in this particular town, your DRB addresses that and, and, and quite strong. And that's where it was also up to the, the uh, Regional Planning Commission. If it does have, you know, regional impact, you could have a two acre project that could have some significant regional impact. Yeah. The, the Regional Planning Commission can step well, in. Well, let, let me clarify that. So their determination of regional impact only applies to projects that would go through Act 50. So, if the threshold goes to 10 acres, if there's a um, project on a two or a five acre site, right. it we won't go through that. Act 250 unless it's a, a larger housing project. It's different. But uh, they, they won't have any role to play. It'll strictly be local. So I just wanted but to make sure. You could have a four or five acre housing project that it could be, you know, yeah, have, over have 10, been that over yeah. 10 but, regional. I, I mean, I, I did try to. Say you know this is this is the board the board needs to make that this this decision. There were a couple of select board members, frankly, were the driving force between the last time when we adopted this ordinance to, to keep it. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you that you know since 1986 I've been on one or another board at VLCT, and the VLCT policy clearly states that you know we should advocate for local control. Uh, we know our community better than the district commission does. We know what we can handle. And I agree with everyone who said that we have a, a good planning commission and a good DRB. They get in difficulties sometime. Uh, if, if there was never controversy, it would be a sign that they're not doing their job. I think that we can handle this generally. And I think that the League of Cities and Towns has 
has basically told the state, look, let us do our job and let us do it the way that we think is best. Um, so I, I think you, that is the best advocacy that I could make to changing this ordinance. And the fact that there's only three towns that have subdivision regulations and, and have the ordinance like ours, three towns including us, uh, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the, what we should be looking at. Why are we with these only two other towns and not uh, taking on responsibility that we frankly have been advocating for in, in uh, legislative policy through the League of Cities and Towns for a long time. So I know I'm, it, it might appear I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. I don't mean to do that, <laughs> I don't mean to do that but I, I think that, you know, that's something that ought to be considered. And, you know, John and, and uh, Duncan have already told us and, and the other John have already told us, you don't have to decide tonight. So this is something that we can put on another agenda and kick around a little bit more. And we're happy to come back if you want to. Yeah, I think the other thing I would suggest is to have a conversation involving the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is working on our Unified Development Bylaws. And um, part of the previous discussion was that select board members felt that we really needed to uh, beef up, if you will, our review criteria that deal with our historic districts, our historic sites. Your, your project is in an historic district that's across from the a church that's individually listed on the National Register. So I think, um, you know, looking at, at the, some of these criteria is very important. The Planning Commission is, is going to be doing that. So I would encourage you to have a conversation, you know, maybe a joint meeting with the Planning Commission to talk about this, make sure everybody's on the same page. Because I know the Planning Commission members have some concerns about um, our, our bylaws dealing with site plan review and conditional use are predate my starting here. So they're they're over 30 years old. They have not been changed significantly since then. So I don't know if you have anything to add. I was going to be invited before I just get invited myself up, but since we're doing the same thing. Come on, grab a chair down um, there. Yeah, please. I guess it's so far. I think you all know me. Um, so I guess I'll acknowledge like everyone in the community, I'm wearing two hats. So I'm coming today as chair of the planning commission and just want to say up front that my individual feelings might not be that, but um, as Steve alluded to what the planning commission asked me to share is just in the spirit of open conversation, like John and Duncan came tonight, if you all as a select board are considering act 250, given that we're the local boarding commission that spends two meetings a month thinking about land use planning in the community, um, the group would like to be involved or at least be able to provide comment. Um, Steve also talked about the zoning rewrite and that was just something shared by um, committee members as well, just that we are actively, as you know, going through a zoning rewrite. Personally, it's why I wanted to join the planning commission and so, um, to the extent, you know, I want to be pragmatic and realistic with the planning commission and with John and Duncan. So like, we don't know what the, the timeline is for that, but I think as Steve expressed, it's been something that's been raised in terms of what an overlap might look like in that regard. Um, and I guess I would just say personally, I think as most of this group knows, I was the economic development director for three and a half years. Chris Perro's memo about Act 250 was the first thing I got when I got into town. Um, you know, I would say just more of an FYI on the Planning Commission, but um, Bill Shepelek and Steve and I had a meeting after Dina retired about some administrative updates um, at our last Planning Commission last Monday. We asked Steve L to do some updates because right now there's like a litany of technical and administrative updates. Um, that haven't been done in like 20 years. So we don't meet state statute in some things in our current regs. So just kind of furthering the theme tonight, I would just say, again, I'm not taking a stance personally and certainly not on behalf of the planning commission about if you should or shouldn't make this change. And I think the big message is we'd like to be involved, but I would just raise that one flag as a piece to say, there might be some minor cleanups before water grade zoning regs are ready for prime time with or without 
at 251 acre, but maybe especially without. So again, sure. you know, the big the big mesh is, is you know similar to what Mike said. It's just the planning commission would be interested in being involved. Um, editorially, I mean, we have myself, we have Martha Stackus, who's a renewable energy developer. We have someone who works in campus planning. Um, I don't want to speak for other members, again, or the commission as a whole, but I think this group would like to support sustainable development in the community and, and do it as quickly, but also being thoughtful about the full community impact. Um, and this kind of, again, tough duality where maybe one project that really makes sense. Or, you know, again, personally, I think it would be great to get to a place where we've done a rewrite, we feel really good, and then can come back with a really strong recommendation, but that's just me. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it's obvious that we're not going to make a decision tonight. I do think that just with the changes to the Planning Commission and, and um, you taking overhead, we should do that joint meeting anyways. I think after what we went through in the last couple months, it makes sense to just check in with each other this should absolutely be discussed on top of you know the planning commission's work and how we can help. So thank you for coming. I, I appreciate everyone's time. I think we all need to think about it and we need to have those conversations and understand exactly what that decision means. But I do personally hate hearing that it might create problems for these projects that are between one and 10. And I, I personally would love a day that we get to a point where we can handle them in Waterbury without sending them back to the I have a couple things before we move on. Um, can we make that, whether it's um, in the parking lot or even on the next agenda, to, to, to reach out and create a joint meeting so it's not one of those things we yeah. want to do and don't yeah. do? So just actively put that on that. Um, totally great. To do this. Yeah, we have um, a schedule. Yeah. yeah, and then the next is are there other other voices, are there other um, people that we could benefit from bringing into this conversation, and and let's think about that um, as well. Other, I don't know if she'd be willing, but Susan Baird would be a great resource mm -hmm. as the district court. Yeah, I just want to make a point though, John. If yeah. um, if projects between one and acres do not go through Act 50, if it changes, who won't have any involvement? I mean, she won't. Right. She, she's on, on, yes. on the record, she's it's been a burden to their office to have to manage extra projects from Waterbury that they wouldn't normally have to manage there, especially with the pandemic. Uh, you know, they're they're just behind and it's and that's why we're worried about a delay is um, going through after 50 post pandemic or during the pandemic, everything slows way, way down. Steve, do you have any kind of numbers how many per year that we have these one to ten acres? It's very, ones? it's very. I don't, I don't think we have many. Paros was the last one, right? That, uh, in that one to ten acres, so that was a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been one every, every five, five years. six years, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't have come back except it's so applicable. And, yeah, well, sure. And and I, you know, after seeing what happened to Perot and thinking about how well the DRB works on projects that I, I just really think you guys have got. We've got a good, a good town that's managed well and better than many towns that I deal with. And I, I don't think we need that 250, but that's my humble opinion. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks for coming. So all set? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck, Dr. Thank you. All right, continued discussion regarding racial equity training. Okay, um, Carla is passing out a uh, and the contents of an email that I got today very late this afternoon. It was after five o'clock or just before five o'clock that I got this from Mary Gannon. And um, she and I talked last week. And, uh, you know, I think that the two sessions that we have had have been quite good, but we've ended up kind of talking about issues that um, are kind of front and center for the for the select board right now, which is a fine thing, but we haven't really allowed 
uh, Mary to get through her presentation yet. Um, I guess what I would recommend tonight, since it's already 930, is just take this, uh, take this home with you and read it, and then we'll put this issue on the next agenda. Really, we're trying to decide whether the select board wants to have one more session or not. And, um, you know, I think reading this from Mary will give you some insight into what she sees. Uh, she thinks that it would be helpful. Obviously, she gets paid to do it. So some could say, well, she's got a vested interest in, in recommending that. But I think that uh, she makes some good arguments there. And I would leave it to the board, you know, if you want to put this on a, uh, on your next agenda, that might be the best place for it. Okay. Uh, any questions? We're going to take this home and we can discuss it. Um, all right. We'll move on then to manager's items. Okay. Thank you. So speaking of next agenda, You've just talked about, you know, this Act 250 thing. We're talking about this potential training. Uh, your next meeting is scheduled for August 16th. Uh, I will be on vacation that week. Uh, I won't be here on the 16th. You're certainly, my wife would be thrilled if you met without me. And, you know, I would get, <laughs> I would get a select board meeting off, but um, there are five, Mondays in August, so uh, there's a potential to move the meeting either to the 23rd or the 30th and still have uh, me involved if you wanted that. Um, again, you don't have to decide that now. Mark is the chair. He can communicate with, with Carla to uh, decide when the meeting will be, but I won't be here on the 16th. Does anyone have an issue with us moving the select board meeting to the 23rd? I can't be there, but I'm okay. I'll be driving back from North Carolina. I mean, obviously, I think it's good if Bill's in town. We, we would have a forum otherwise. Yeah, fine. I'll be in town. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we just move it to the 23rd. I think that's fine. <laughs> okay. I may be out of town, but Bill okay. can cover my absence. Yeah. <laughs> Carl will be missed, but. We can take care of or Karen for the minutes and stuff like that. Okay. Um, okay, so does everybody have the budget report? Do you want me to put it up on the screen? They have it, we all have, it. or I can share it either way. Are there people watching that want it on the screen? I would it only be Christopher or I don't believe that or Linda. Bill, um, can I ask a quick question? How long do you think this will be? I, I know that uh, Linda and Christopher are here. I'm wondering if maybe we can shift that up real quick so they don't have to sit through this part of the meeting. Is is the are you and is the board okay if we maybe just move that quickly? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, I, don't I can wait. Okay. Um, Thank you for your patience. Chris, thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, the joys of service. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously we need to pick someone. I think all three candidates are incredibly well, like versed in being able to handle this. So, um, you know, we need to pick someone who is the main delegate and the alternate. Um, I don't know if anyone, I, it's, awkward that we like do it publicly in front of everybody so <laughs> <laughs> we apologize um i don't know if everyone wants i don't know what the way to do this that is fair and whatever i don't know if everyone just i don't know i don't know how to do that but i do think we should just make a decision um I don't know if everyone wants to just quickly speak on their number one and number two choice and i'll try to keep track and see where we landed or we can do, can we do like, uh, well, we do a little clouds or I don't know. Yeah. I'll be honest. To me, Dennis, just because of his lack of ex experience, direct experience, is, is my third candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, between the other two candidates, 
can't pretty equally match it. You know, sometimes I almost want to give a little more experience to someone who's been here a little more time and maybe knows a little more, nothing against Chris. I know that it's, I think he would be a very good candidate, but I think, you know, based upon that, it's Beth? Linda. 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 So my choice would be Linda and then Chris would be the alternate. That's exactly what I was going to propose as well. So there is. 100% with you. Yeah, that would be my choice. Now, is there an opportunity if for some reason between the two of them, if they wanted to switch places? Because, yeah, I think so. I mean, basically, one, one, it would be al alternate, meaning I'm assuming. He's not here anymore, but I would think that it would be if one person can't make the meeting, the other one represents, and mm -hmm. hopefully if one person decided they didn't want to participate right. anymore, the other person would step right. up and we would go find an additional mm -hmm. alternate. Okay. Too much. It was too I, much. The one thing I don't know on this for both candidates is if you both can attend the meetings or yeah. plan to attend the meetings and help each other with scheduling. So that's an answer that we would need to. Yeah. We, used, we used to do that all the time on the DRB. Our alternates, we almost looked at them as regular members, mm -hmm. even though they were alternates. So, you know, we didn't have enough of a quorum. They were ready to step in. So if they could both attend meetings, I think that just gives us more of a brain power going into meetings. Yeah, and but Linda would have the first say in terms of voting. Bill, maybe you know the answer to this, but this potentially could mean an alternative for Comcast users as well, right? As they go along, does this mean that they're only identifying and working with CD Fiber? I mean, obviously, the properties that are quote unquote underserved are priorities, but as they pass houses that already have maybe Comcast, can those potentially become fiber candidates as well? Yeah, I don't know a lot about what CD Fiber has been discussing. I, I my guess is, Mark, that would be the case. Um, you know, the unfortunate part is that because we, as Steve suggested earlier, because we have, uh, in comparison to many communicate many uh, communities, we have very good high speed access here. We have only pockets of our town that don't have it. And because we haven't been part of CV Fiber uh, until now, um, you know, we're kind of behind the curve a little bit. And whether they can adjust what their recommendations are in the short term to include Waterbury or not, that's, that's going to be the first question I think right. that's going to have to be asked. But I think everything is on the table, Mark, that if they decided you know, that there's a way to um, go up Ring Road with something other than Comcast that other people along the way could choose that alternative as well. And I would hope that we could do that and have a more competitive marketplace instead of everyone feeling they have one option. So I would hope that right. this include any property in Waterbury in the future. This just gets us on that path. Um, Comcast keeps raising prices. And so yes. it would really be good not to have a monopoly. Sure. Competition is good. Um, okay. Well, I think it sounds like the board is voting Linda in as the main delegate and Christopher as the alternate delegate. Um, if that works for everyone. I'm not sure who is the liaison moving forward for the delegates and the town and this group. Is it just, how, how does that work, Bill? Do you know? Who would they be working with or communicating? Is it with Carla? And who hands them off to CV Fiber? Probably our... Steve. Okay. So Steve would be the, what we'll do once you appoint folks, uh, Steve will communicate with CV Fiber, let them know who the, who the uh, representative and the alternate are, and then the then CV Fiber will contact these people. So Steve will be the, the one who actually sends their name off to uh, CV5. Okay, I will take a motion. I move that the board appoint uh, Linda Gravel as main delegate and Christopher Shank as alternate delegate to CV5. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye.
thank you very much for volunteering to do this. We look forward to hearing the progress. And yeah, if there's anything we can do as a town, maybe let us Carla know. can send um, information for contact. Sure. Um, I would love Chris to do contact. So I'll shoot you all an email tomorrow and copy Steve. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all very much. Yeah, thank Thanks you for being patient. We know you have a lot of sure. going on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thanks for doing that. Uh, all right, back to budget. Okay, um, I'll do my best to finish by 10 o'clock. Um, if we don't finish by 10 o'clock, it's because you folks have a lot of questions. Um, I apologize for not being able to send out some notes along with this. Um, it's been quite busy and we haven't had a budget report really since um, I think the first meeting that Danny was on the board. So we really need to do it. Uh, there have been some uh, things that we have found out in the past couple of weeks that are important. Um, I have highlighted uh, in yellow or green or blue some things that I wanna talk about. Um, most of it is we can be pretty uh, succinct with. Um, the $20 there on the tax sale, don't worry about that at the time being, that was a question that I need to look into. Um, traffic control income, you can see we're quite low uh, compared to our budget. $326 have been uh, received year to date uh, for traffic tickets that the state police write. We budgeted $6,000. We made a little more than $6,000 last year. Uh, COVID has been a big impact on this uh, for many months. They were not doing a lot of uh, ticket writing. They were not doing a lot of traffic stops due to uh, social distancing requirements. And the big factor that I didn't think about when we budgeted is that um, there's a big lag oftentimes between when a ticket is written and when the fine actually gets sent to us. If you get a, a speeding ticket, you have to send the money to the State of Vermont Judicial Bureau. Sometimes people challenge the tickets. The Judicial Bureau collects the tickets and then kind of on their own time schedule, they send it out to the communities. So, um, it doesn't look like we're gonna come close. And I'd be surprised if we even make the $2,000 that I budget that I projected there. But it's a minor revenue, but I wanted to let you know why there's a big discrepancy. Pilot, there's good news on the pilot front. We budgeted $160,000 to go into the general fund. And we budgeted $20,000 to go into the paving fund. So that's $180,000 we were thinking that we were going to get from the state. We were very conservative in our budgeting. I got notice uh, last month that we're going to end up with about uh, $350,000 uh, of pilot money, about a little bit more, actually, I think, than we got all together last year. So we'll be able to. Uh, deposit our full 160 into the general fund, and then the paving fund will get the remainder. So that's that's good news. Um, the message from the state comes with a caveat saying these figures may change. So until we get the check, which usually comes in October or November, we won't know for sure. But right now it looks pretty good. So just just to be clear on that too, they they say that all of that money is only comes from local option tax collected around the state, or is there another mechanism that allows them to fund that? Uh, I believe it's all from local option tax. Um, I'm I'm surprised given what happened last year. Um, all I'm reporting to you is what they've reported to me right now. It doesn't give any uh, any more details. Um, you know if there's like a year delay and somehow it didn't drop because this is going on. Yeah, um, there is there is a year delay, but we should be in that year already. Um, I can check on that. If we get it all this year, I'll I'll check again for next year. But 
uh, it's looking pretty good right now. Okay. Uh, same thing for forest and parks and current use. We budgeted about a third of what we received last year. Uh, looks like we're going to get the full amount this year. 91,000 and 105,000. So that that's uh, that's good news. And I'll, I'll talk about some implications of that in a little bit. Um, so that explains why the subtotal there under other governments is 600,000 as opposed to the 472 that we budgeted. Under service fees, um, the things that are highlighted in yellow are all recreation related. Uh, so um, the pool income, the 38,292, that's what we have taken in for our eight week summer uh, pool season. Um, and uh, the 46,000 projects what we will take in in the fall for uh, fall swim lessons, fall lifeguard training and the like. I met with Nick this afternoon and uh, he's pretty confident that we'll end at 46,000. You can see the, the recreation program revenues, uh, that's for the summer program. Uh, we've exceeded budget already there. Uh, we probably won't take in much more than that 100,780. The uh, mini camp, it's really misnamed now. Mini camp is where we're spending money for what we do all year other than the summer recreation program. So there are some mini camp revenues in there like the uh, hunting and fishing mini camp that they're gonna have in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the bulk of that revenue comes from the uh, academy that they had during the school year when the school was closed on Wednesdays, um, after school programs that they had uh, last spring. And, and the projection of the 45,000 is really what will happen between now and the end of the year. Uh, there is uh, an after school program that is uh, has already been advertised and there's people that have already signed up. Uh, so we'll be taking in revenue there. The recreation donations, uh, 60,000 of that 63,700 that was taken in is from Albertsons, the parent company of Shaw's. That uh, money can be spent for uh, uh, the summer feeding program that we're using for the, for the children at all three sites. The senior center is not doing anything with meals this year at all. So Nick has a number of uh, local restaurants that are helping make breakfasts and lunch. And that program is going very well, but obviously that was a big, uh, a big donation we weren't expecting. Um, skip past the tax stabilization fund thing there uh, and go to the bottom. Um, we're also expecting this year a transfer in from the ARPA um, program, which is the federal um, federal program in in uh, in response to COVID. This is a direct payment from the federal government to the uh, to the cities and towns of the country. They will send it to the state. And then the state will forward it to us with no no state strings attached. Our um, our total that we will receive from that is about five hundred and forty thousand um, dollars. Half of it will come in this calendar year, probably within the next couple of uh, weeks, and then the other half, another two sixty nine eight thirty three, will come in calendar year two thousand twenty two. So if you look back at that, um, the one in green there from tax stabilization fund, we have budgeted to transfer $50,000 from the tax stabilization fund to the general fund. Um, right now, the tax stabilization fund is doing okay. But um, on these revenues right now, if we, if we do take in, um, that $50,000 from the tax stabilization fund, our revenues are projecting at 3,502,000. Uh, 
about a half a million dollars more than we projected. So we don't have to decide tonight, but my recommendation probably will be, let's not transfer any money out of the tax stabilization fund this year. Let's let it grow and uh, use it some year down the road when we need it. I don't think we're gonna need it in 2021. Uh, very quickly, unless, does anybody have any questions on the revenues right now? Bill, on that half a million dollars in access revenue, do we just leave that? What do we do with that? And is there an opportunity to potentially, do we need to make a decision at some point to move that to CRP or maybe even fund more into the tax stabilization fund? Yeah, so, so I think both of those things are, things that we should talk about at some point, Mark, but really for the purposes of um, how municipal budgeting and finance go, we probably should just end up with a bigger fund balance at the end of this year. And then in our budget discussions for next year, decide where we wanna put that. Uh, I don't think we should do it necessarily this year. On the ARPA funds, that 269,833, um, we can we can consider that as um, we had lost revenues enough in 2020, a year ago, that we can bring this ARPA money in and we can say that it's going to replace revenues that we lost last year, and then just falls to the bottom line. Uh, when we do our budgeting, we will have to have some hearings on how we're going to use the opera money. But if we consider it lost revenue, then we can just appropriate it and basically use it anywhere we would like next year. It will have to be appropriated by the voters. If we didn't have that lost revenue, uh, and we do, but if we did not have that lost revenue, there are some restrictions on how we can use that money. In other words, we couldn't use that money for roads and bridges if we didn't have lost revenue a year ago, because there's going to be an infrastructure bill that comes down the pike, and they don't want uh, last year this ARPA money being used for, for infrastructure, except to do things that were put on hold a year ago if you lost revenue. So we can talk about it all uh, later this year, uh, but I think it, it will be best marked if we do it all in the 2022 budget process and decide where to park money at that point. Any other questions right now? So I'm gonna go quickly through the general fund expenditures. Um, on the um, in the general fund, it looks like we're going to be spending about fifteen thousand dollars more than we had appropriated. Uh, there's two main line items that uh, are over budget right now. One is uh, computer services. I told you about the you know a couple of months ago. I told you about the hack that we had into our system. Uh, Bob Butler, our IT tech. Uh, uh, contractor had to do quite a bit of work in the system, and that's where the major overspending is there. I'm projecting out for the next, um, you know, the next through the end of the year that we'll probably spend about five thousand dollars more. Um, I will try to offset that. Uh, you can see the professional services other line is uh, way under right now. And then there's office supplies that is somewhat under, and there's new equipment down toward the bottom. <clears throat> I'll try to kind of pull in the reins on those three lines to try to, uh, to offset that. Legal expenses are higher than anticipated as well. We've had uh, a couple of different things that we needed attorneys for that we did not really plan for at the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of an unknown. Uh, we we you know things have come up that we needed attorneys for. And uh, you know a few years ago we we decided we were going to budget twelve thousand dollars a year for legal. We haven't spent twelve thousand for a couple of for a couple of years now. But this year it looks like we're going to go over that amount. Uh, it may not go over by the full. Uh, 
you know, 60 and 361, we're not even at 10 yet. So I'm hoping that maybe we won't go over there as much either. But the general government looks like it's going to be a little bit overspent. Um, if you look at the fire department budget, same thing there. We had a, we had a before we go on, I have a question. Yeah. On general government, like where is Mary's diversity training? Where is that showing up? The training line, six thousand dollars, about two thirds of the way down from the top line. Highlighted in yellow. Okay, I see that now. Okay. So that six thousand dollars assumes we have one or something like that. That's why I was surprised. What's that? Nothing, Bill. You're good. Fire You're department. You're good. <laughs> All right. If you look in the if you look in the fire department budget, vehicle maintenance, we've already spent twice as much in that line item as we had budgeted. We had a, a significant problem with the uh, aerial ladder truck. There was a problem with the turntable, uh, hydraulic pumps, and the like. We ended up having to send the truck to Connecticut. It was out of service for a couple of months, uh, and it had to be it had to be repaired. Uh, there was uh, really nothing that could be done. If we didn't make the repairs, we would have just left it in the garage because you couldn't use it. So we had to spend that that money to uh, fix the fix the truck. I'm hoping again some of these. Some of these numbers are just formula based, and I think the sixty thousand that is showing up there um, as a projected spending for that line item simply divides uh, the thirty five thousand dollars by seven months, and then multiplies multiplies it by twelve. So that sixty thousand dollars is probably high. I don't think we're going to spend at the same rate for the rest of the year as we spent through the first part of the year. So I I forgot to kind of make that adjustment. Uh, the new equipment line at $75,000, uh, I've talked to Gary, I'll be continuing talking to Gary. We may, if we have to, uh, again, cut out some of the spending that we had planned there to offset the overspending on the, uh, on the vehicle maintenance line. So that's that. Uh, to turn over to the next page, uh, the next highlights are all in the in the summer recreation programs. Um, the, the recreation pay for summer program is just slightly above what we what we projected. The uh, the camps, uh, school and after school programs used to be called mini camps. That's uh, projecting out at $25,000 because of what we're planning to do in the fall in addition to what we already did in the spring. Uh, we've already talked about the revenues that cover that. The $65,000 down in the program line, that is really the, uh, the, the breakfast and lunch program. We've got to spend all that money that Albertsons um, donated on that program. So it's for purchasing food, it's for uh, some of the transportation, going to get the food, distributing it um, and the like. So that 65,000 is likely what we're gonna spend there. So in the, in the program, the summer program, which is more than summer now, that's misnamed too, it's really year round. Uh, we're projecting out at 202,000 as opposed to the 129 that was budgeted. Um, and then I didn't highlight things in rec administration. There's nothing that's really overspent uh, or going to be overspent there. We're projecting out at right on budget, $104,000. Uh, the parks, we're at um, projecting out at about 88,000. I think I skipped over pool, but uh, pool is not significantly above where we had projected either. You can see down there in green, though, at the bottom, what I've done is I totaled up all of the budgeted expenses for pool programs, rec admin, and parks, and that budget was 411815. 
Uh, the expenses right now um, are coming in at 487,503, so significantly higher. But the revenues uh, are projected uh, at 272,580 versus the 164 that we budgeted. So the net expense for the recreation programs, frankly, will be less than what we uh, anticipated. Now, doesn't mean the taxpayers aren't paying anything. The taxpayers are still paying for the bulk of the recreation programs, but right now it's looking like the taxpayers are going to be paying about 215,000 out of the 487. Um, and when we put the budget together, the taxpayers were going to be spending about 248 out of 411. So the percentage that the taxpayers are paying for this year is lower and the actual dollar figures look like it will be lower as well. Any questions there? All set? Okay, the planning department, there's a few yellow lines in there. Um, uh, you know, Steve's pay is gonna be up a little bit. Uh, he's doing uh, zoning administrative work right now and will be continuing that through the time that we hire uh, the, the position that we're trying to um, uh, recruit for, you know, to replace Dina. If you remember, you, you have authorized us to restructure the department a little bit. So those two pay lines, I think that Steve's line, which is regular pay, is uh, gonna be a little bit over budget and the zoning administrator line uh, or the assistant planning zoning director that we're gonna call it now will probably be a little bit under. I don't know how much, it's all gonna be a factor of how long it takes to get somebody hired. Uh, we've advertised, we've got a number of candidates right now, uh, not too many real qualified candidates yet. So um, we're, we're gonna take our time we're going to try to hire the right person who has the qualifications that we're looking to have. Uh, but uh, it's a tight job labor market right now. There's, there's many more people looking to hire people than there are people wanting to be hired right now. So it will be a little bit of a challenge, perhaps. <laughs> Health insurance, we're going to underspend that because uh, we're going to have at least one month that we don't have somebody taking health insurance. Dina was taking that. Um, you know, we're heading into August. We won't have anybody working in August. So that could go lower than, than what's projected there. Um, legal fees, we're spending a little bit above um, uh, budget on that one. We've already spent more than we budgeted in the planning department. Uh, and that's likely to go higher. We've got uh, two enforcement cases going on um, right now. Um, we had the, uh, uh, and then we've had a lot of reviews for the interim bylaws that you enacted. So, um, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, planning revenue, we didn't look at that on the first page. It's, it's tracking about where we expected it would. Um, planning fees, we budgeted 24,000. Right now, it's looking at like it'll be about 21,000 or so coming in. So it's a little cracking, a little bit behind right now, but uh, we may we may pick that up during the rest of the year. And really, that's it. Um, debt management. We had to just do a modest amount of um, tax anticipation borrowing from uh, EFUD. Um, there's a, there'll be another uh, $300, three or $400 worth of interest that we owe there perhaps, uh, but I'm thinking we're past the stage that we're gonna have to do much more tax anticipation borrowing. So we'll probably save money there. If you look at that last page under special articles, uh, we'll spend all of what the voters appropriated for special articles, uh, given that Right now, our expenditures are tracking about $100,000 more than what we budgeted. But remember, most of that is in the recreation departments. Um, you know, that 
that food program in particular, uh, and a little bit in the general fund. So the $100,000 uh, above budget, as far as expenses are concerned, as far as the projection, will be offset by those revenues. So we anticipated ending the year with an $11 negative fund balance. Right now, it's projecting that we'll have about $325,000 to the good if we don't transfer that money from the uh, from the tax stabilization fund, we will end the general fund with about a $275,000 fund balance. Obviously, this can change. We've still got, uh, you know, uh, what, five months to go in the year. Um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with tax collections. I'm hoping that we'll do better than last year, but um, things are looking pretty good right now as far as the general fund is concerned. I'll take one minute to go over the highway and the library funds. There's, uh, in, the, in the highway fund, there's good news. We, we budgeted only $85,000 for general state aid. As you can see, we've already received more than we budgeted. Uh, they did not pull back. The legislature uh, actually added a little bit of money to uh, the general state aid. So. We, we're looking like we're probably going to get about $117,000 um, at year end there. And then that grant, I'm, I'm thinking that grant was something that we did last year and the money didn't come until this year and the auditors had adjusted the, uh, the fund balance of the highway fund for 2020. I didn't have time to look into exactly what that grant is for. We clearly didn't budget it, um, but I'm thinking it was something that we spent last year and the money didn't come until this, this year. Um, on the expense side in the highway fund, things are looking right on target right now. Um, I'm projecting some slight underspending in the budget this year compared to what we budgeted for. Um, uh, because of that additional revenue that we weren't planning for, it's looking like the highway fund might end, end up with a modest surplus in the $68,000 range, um, you know, which is $68,000 more than we budgeted for. Uh, we did carry forward about $158,000 into this year. We thought it was one forty-three, dollars but the auditors found a little bit more money. So things are looking good there. Uh, same in the library fund. Um, the, um, the revenues are slightly above target. On the spending side, we're going to underspend on health insurance because uh, Aldi Landauer, the former librarian, has resigned. Uh, the new librarian decided not to take health insurance, so we're not going to spend any more this year than the 88.19, probably. Um, we do have one position that's open that that does um, uh, offer health insurance that uh, works enough hours potentially, but I, I think it's probably going to be, um, I, I actually think the job that's open does not work enough hours for uh, getting health insurance. So we're probably not going to spend more than the 88.19 this year. Um, and the library fund looks like all things considered will end up with a modest surplus of about $9,700. So anyway, that was 10 minutes longer than I hoped. Uh, kind of a rush through. Always seems like we have to rush through this stuff. But um, things are looking good right now. I did not give you the, um, the uh, CIP budgets. Um, if you've been up there, you've seen that Blush Hill has been um, ground up. The pavement's all been taken off of Blush Hill. Um, and we're, <clears throat> we've replaced two culverts up there. Um, we're going to let those culverts compact under the traffic. The trenches in those culverts will compact under the traffic. And we'll be paving Blush Hill and Lonesome Trail. My guess will be 
um, sometime the end of August, beginning of September. Um, but that's on track right now. Um, did you all see the uh, email I sent out to you on front from Front Porch Forum last week? We've had some vandalism at the tennis court lights and at the skating ring lights where they play volleyball. Uh, I talked to Nick today. It's it's his uh, statement that um, the lighting at those places will be discontinued until further notice is not meant to be punitive on his part. We need to get an electrician in there to fix the damage. We've had to shut the electricity off back at the breaker because you know these vandals broke into the into the timer box uh, and they did some damage in there that would you know if somebody if it was live somebody could get shot. So it's off now and it's not going to be on until we can get somebody in there to do some work. It's disappointing. Um, but I, I want you to know that it's not Nick saying so there, you know, nobody's gonna play on the lights because there was vandalism. We, we, we've got to get an electrician to, to do some work to fix it. Bill, I missed that. Is it something where we think they were actually trying to steal something or they were just doing damage to do damage? No, they, they I think what they did was they were there, the lights go off on the tennis courts at at 10 o'clock and I think people were still playing and they were mad and they broke in and they wanted to turn the lights on and they they turned the lights back on evidently uh, and then um, when Nick when Nick uh, had to close that down um, he put something out uh, you know and he did call the police and let them know uh, it seems like maybe the second one may have been in retribution for the fact that you know the lights on the tennis court went out or maybe they were just hoping that they could get lights on the uh, skating rink uh, and that would be light enough to play in the tennis courts but they broke that too now so nobody was trying to steal anything except electricity for when it should be off bill do we have any security cameras up there no would, would it be wise to invest in trail cams are pretty damn, damn cheap and I hate when people do vandalism and that's a good way to get them on film and I'm more for prosecuting. Yeah, we can, we can think about that, Mike. Um, you know, it's, uh, it becomes another target, of course, once they see them. If they want to vandalize something, they'll vandalize that. But. They're not high enough. Anyway, uh, we don't have them right now. If, if it's something the board wants to look into, we can certainly do that. Thanks, Bill. Anything from the board or we can adjourn for the evening? I just want to quickly ask, how long ago, did, I don't recall hearing a previous issue with a fire truck. Was that brought up previously and I'm not recollecting it? Or are we just hearing about it now for the first time? The turret problem. Is this the first time that we're hearing there's a problem with one of the fire vehicles? Uh, it's probably the first time you're hearing about it. I apologize for that. I, you know, I, I've known about it for quite some time. It's just, I didn't, I guess I didn't think to share it. But yeah, I, I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing new. The truck is back in service now. It's, it's here and, and usable. But it happened back in April, I think. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, that line item, the real repair was maybe an increase of like fifteen, ten or fifteen thousand dollars, not that full plus thirty or whatever it was I had written down. Yeah, I'd have to, I, I'd have to look. I can, I can okay. tell you at the next meeting, or if you want to hang around right now, I can tell you. But. Uh, it looks nice worse meeting. than maybe it is, but like you know, highway stuff's gonna break, they're gonna spend right. some grand. I, yeah, I would just like to know that stuff before we get to that budget, and then we're like, whoa, well, what's this for? Right, some of it's safety related, we have to, we can't right. delay yeah. repair on that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize, I could have told the board before, I just you know, we hadn't had a budget report, I didn't think about it. Um, but let me see if I can quickly find it here. Right.
the turret would have issues. Yeah, like there's that. the turntable and some hydraulics, I believe, Chris. Bill, with your and Nick's exposure, uh, is our meeting tomorrow? Is that on or off? Um, I I sent you an email. From my perspective, it's it's on. Me. I mean, I don't. Okay. I, I'm not real concerned. I just I I told you and Mark that if we meet, you know, I'm happy to wear a mask. We can sit in the steel room and be socially distant. It just I I felt compelled right now to wear a mask tonight, and it was a lot easier to talk and have this discussion without a mask on. So I decided to sit in here, that's all. Uh, so Mark, unfortunately, the um, we've spent 35,215 for vehicle maintenance right now for the hot, for the uh, fire department and 31,600 of it is for that particular yes. issue. So it was all that. And as I said, I'll be talking to Gary you know, we had $15,000, almost $16,000 budgeted. So we'll probably, you know, pull back a little bit and we'll watch the calendar and see what we can do. Some of the maintenance that he has is scheduled that needs to be done. Uh, I don't think we're going to end up spending the 60 that I had projected there, but it was a big expense. I don't have, I just have, uh, you know, the, the amount here, I don't have the bill to tell you what it was, but I know it was with the uh, the turntable and the hydraulics for the lab, I think, so. Yeah. Any other questions? Second. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Any further aye. discussion? Aye. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Thank Bill. you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Stay Thank healthy. You.